The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder to all members, we will conclude today's hearing at 1 p.m. Members who were unable to ask questions at our July hearing with Chair Pro Tempore Powell will be given priority to ask their questions today. And we will return to our normal order of recognition once those members <coughs> have asked their questions. This hearing is entitled Monetary Policy and the State of the Economy. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. I want to start by reiterating that I join with President Biden and our allies in condemning Russia's shameful, premeditated, and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. I stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Chair Pro Tempore Powell, since the last time you testified in July 2021, the United States economy has continued to boom and our recovery from COVID-19 pandemic is strong. Since the beginning of the Biden administration in January 2021, our economy added over 7 million jobs, a record in the first year of a new presidency. In addition, wages and salaries for workers grew by 4.5% in 2021, the highest level in close to 40 years. While these are encouraging figures, we have more work ahead. Families across the nation are facing higher prices because of inflation created not only by pandemic related supply chain problems, but also giant corporations taking advantage of economic conditions to pass on higher prices to consumers. Importantly, housing is a key measure and driver of inflation. For too long, <clears throat> we have not addressed the shortfall in our housing supply. And this lack of supply is driving up prices. In 2021, the national median rent for an apartment jumped by almost 18%, and home prices rose by 17%. These are the true drivers of inflation, according to experts, despite repeated efforts on the part of Republicans to falsely blame pandemic relief and emergency stimulus as a primary cause. To address housing supply and other inflation drivers, the House passed the Build Back Better Act and American Competes, which make transformational investments, including $150 billion in equitable and affordable housing, as well as improvements to our supply chains. Regarding digital assets, the Federal Reserve recently released a paper seeking public feedback on a possible U.S. Central Bank Digital Currency, or CBDC which would provide an alternative to volatile cryptocurrencies and benefit financial inclusion and promote national security. On the other side of that digital coin is a concern that pariah states like Russia may use foreign CBDCs to relieve the pressure of our carefully coordinated multilateral sanctions. Leadership from the Fed on these issues is more important than ever. Lastly, I would note that for the first time, a chair pro tempore of the Federal Reserve Board is testifying at this hearing. Senate Republicans have chosen to unilaterally block your confirmation. Chair pro tempore Powell and the historic confirmation of diverse and highly qualified nominees to the Board of Governors. Leaving key leadership positions at the Federal Reserve vacant when it is tackling an array of economic issues, including those arising from Russia's invasion on Ukraine. This will undermine our recovery from the pandemic and place our economy and financial stability at risk. At a time of enormous economic uncertainty, rising prices, and geopolitical turmoil, the Fed's legitimacy is on the line. Now is not the moment 
for obstruction, delay, and gamesmanship. So Chair Pro Temporary Powell, I look forward to your testimony this morning. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes. Well, look, uh, at, at Chairman Powell, we appreciate you being here. And I say to the chair of the committee that this is the House. The Senate does nominations. If we wish to have an opinion and, uh, and direct uh, the Senate, we should go run for the Senate. Uh, we have the Fed chair here at a time of unprecedented economic conditions and a, and a war that's happening. I think we should stay focused on that. Uh, chair Powell, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your steady hand and your approach uh, over this quite tumultuous first term of yours. And congratulations on your nomination and the expected uh, confirmation of your second term. Uh, as we all know, the Financial Services Committee Republicans um, uh, have uh, offered um, and requested that the, the Biden administration not approve the $17 billion in an International Monetary Fund special drawing rights for Russia's reserves uh, last year. Uh, my hope is that my Democrat colleagues will withdraw their support for $60 billion in additional reserves from Moscow in this year's omnibus that is being negotiated right now. Uh, we stand in a bipartisan way with the people of Ukraine, and we are grateful for their bravery and we want to do everything in our power to, to assist and support them. Um, again, thank you, Chair Powell, for your leadership. America is uh, facing uh, the worst inflation we've seen in four decades because of Democrats' reckless spending here on Capitol Hill. Instead of a course correction, House Democrats keep hoping the Senate will uh, take up the $2 trillion in new spending through Build Back Better, or whatever they're going to call it. Uh, this would only make rising prices worse for families across the country. A Wharton budget model estimates the average American family spent $3,500 more last year to keep uh, up with rising prices. Nowhere is this more evident than at the supermarket, where folks are seeing a 22% increase in grocery bills, according to a recent uh, KPMG study. For a family of four, this can mean choosing between groceries they need and saving for their child's education, their retirement, or even a home. Uh, the American people should not have to mortgage their future because of uh, Democrats' uh, love of more government spending uh, to give them the illusion of prosperity in the moment. And despite what we've heard from President Biden last night, simply telling people they're better off does not, in fact, make it true. However, I'm pleased that uh, the President sided with Republicans instead of Senator Warren, Elizabeth Warren, when we renominated you, uh, Chairman Powell, uh, when he renominated you. Uh, to chair the Federal Reserve. Uh, but as you know, Chair Powell, you have an enormous task ahead of you. As one of your predecessors famously said, the Fed's job is to take away the punch bowl just as the, the party starts to warm up. Uh, but the but Democrats have drunk deep, and they want to move on to the harder stuff. That is a risk for our economy. Uh, we can't let that happen. I was pleased to see the Fed reject the notion of personal accounts uh, by the central bank. Uh, as, uh, as we've seen recently in Canada, uh, it, uh, and there are unprecedented use of emergency powers to, uh, to freeze hundreds of bank accounts, we need to uh, ask not just how financial authorities can be used, but also how they could potentially be abused. It's disturbing that some Democrats refuse to see this danger and uh, may actually view it as an opportunity to rationalize more government involvement in America's everyday lives. And that's why I sent a letter to regulators today asking for clarity on what this disturbing move that we've seen in Canada uh, could be, uh, if anything to that accord, could be done here in the United States and what we should do to prevent it. And I look forward to uh, hearing their feedback. Uh, again, Chair Powell, thank you for being here. These are unprecedented times uh, that you're serving. Thank you for your steady hand and your leadership uh, and your willingness to answer questions using language that most of us can all understand. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member McHenry. I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, for one minute. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, probably the most effective tool we've deployed against Putin's outrageous attack on Ukraine is the sanctions on the Russian Central Bank and the freezing of Russian foreign reserves. Our ability to do so stems mostly from the dollar's preeminent position as the world's reserve currency. It is time, in fact, it is past time for all of us to lead on creating a regulatory environment in which we, rather than the world's despots, terrorists, and money launderers, benefit from the emergence of cryptocurrency, including a central bank 
digital currency. Mr. Chairman, one of the headlines on my news feed this morning reads, Russians turn to crypto amid increasing sanctions, as the chairwoman uh, indicated. The subcommittee I chair and the full committee have done and will do hard work on this topic, but it is time for all of us to act. Mr. Chairman, I can't shake the image of 17th century bankers sitting around London unable to imagine that their gold pieces and copper plates could be replaced by these worthless pieces of paper. Let's not be those guys. Let's lead and not follow. I now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for one minute. Chairman Powell, thank you for being with us today. Inflation has hit a four-decade high, with CPI surging to 7.5%. Core inflation exceeds 5%. PPI is now pushing 10%. Recently published inflation forecasts predict CPI will rise above 8% in coming months. According to a study from the Wharton School, the average family spent $3,500 more for the same goods and services in 2021 versus 2020. Tax and spend policies are largely to blame. Stephen Ratner, former counsel to the Treasury Secretary under President Obama, put it eloquently in a New York Times op-ed. The $2 trillion American rescue plan was, quote, the original sin that, quote, contributed materially to today's inflation levels, unquote. A potent cocktail of excessive government spending creating excess demand combined with a hostile tax and regulatory environment for private enterprise, which has constrained supply, have together produced a toxic supply-demand mismatch pushing prices up. Compounding these fiscal policy mistakes, the Fed pursued for too long an uncon unconventional and overly accommodated monetary policy, which has resulted in an inflation crisis that is hitting our constituents where it hurts. It is clear the Fed is not satisfying its price stability mandate. I look forward to hearing from you on the path forward to address the monetary policy side of this equation. I yield back. I want to welcome our distinguished witness today, the Honorable, the Honorable Jerome Powell, the Chair Pro Tempore of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Chair Pro Tempore, Powell, you are now recognized to present your oral testimony. Thank you. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and other members of the committee, I'm pleased to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. Before I begin, let me briefly address Russia's attack on Ukraine. The conflict is causing tremendous hardship for the Ukrainian people. The implications for the U.S. economy are highly uncertain, and we will be monitoring the situation closely. At the Fed, we're strongly committed to achieving the monetary pol goals, policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. We pursue these goals based solely on data and objective analysis, and we're committed to doing so in a clear and transparent manner so that the American people and their representatives in Congress understand our policy actions and can hold us accountable. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. Economic activity expanded at a robust 5.5% pace last year, reflecting progress on vaccinations and the reopening of the economy fiscal and monetary policy support, and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. The rapid spread of the Omicron variant led to some slowing in economic activity early this year, but with cases having declined <clears throat> sharply since mid-January, the slowdown seems to have been brief. The labor market is extremely tight. Payroll employment, employment rose by 6.7 million in 2021, and job gains were again robust in January. The unemployment rate declined substantially over the past year and stood at 4% in January, reaching the median of FOMC participants' estimates of its longer-run normal level. The improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, and while labor force participation has ticked up, labor supply remains subdued. <coughs> as a result, Employers are having difficulties filling job openings. An unprecedented number of workers are quitting to take new jobs, and wages are rising at their fastest pace in many years. Inflation increased sharply last year and is now running well above our longer-run objective of 2%. Demand is strong, and bottlenecks and supply constraints are limiting how quickly production can respond. 
these supply disruptions have been larger <clears throat> and longer lasting than anticipated, exacerbated by waves of the virus, and price increases are now spreading to a broader range of goods and services. We understand, <clears throat> that, we understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We know that the best thing we can do to support a strong labor market is to promote a long expansion, and that is only possible in an environment of price stability. The committee will continue to monitor incoming economic data and will adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate to manage risks that could impede the attainment of its goals. The committee's assessments will take into account a wide range of information, including labor market conditions, inflation pressures and inflation expectations, and financial and international developments. We continue to expect inflation to decline over the course of the year as supply constraints ease and demand moderates because of the waning effects of fiscal support and the removal of monetary policy accommodation. But we are attentive to the risks <clears throat> of potential further upward pressure on inflation expectations and inflation itself from a number of factors. We will use our policy tools as appropriate to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched while promoting a sustainable expansion and a strong labor market. Our monetary policy has been adapting to the evolving economic environment and it will continue to do so. We've phased out our net asset purchases with inflation well above 2% and a strong labor market. We expect it will be appropriate to raise the target range for the federal funds rate at our meeting later this month. The process of removing policy accommodation in current circumstances will involve both increases in the target range of the federal funds rate and reduction in the size of the Fed's balance sheet. As the FOMC noted in January, the Fed funds rate is our primary means <clears throat> of adjusting the stance of monetary policy. Reducing our balance sheet will commence after the process of raising interest rates has begun and will proceed in a predictable manner primarily through adjustments to reinvestments. The near-term effects on the U.S. economy of the invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing war with sanctions, and of events yet to come remain highly uncertain. Making appropriate monetary policy in this environment requires a recognition that the economy evolves in unexpected ways. We will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Maintaining the trust and confidence of the public is essential to our work. Last month, we finalized a comprehensive set of new ethics rules to substantially strengthen the investment restrictions on senior Federal Reserve officials. These new rules will guard against even the appearance of any conflict of interest. They are tough and best in class in government here and around the world. We understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission we at the Federal Reserve will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I now <clears throat> recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Chair Pro Tempore Powell, as you know, the Fed is required to conduct monetary policy in a manner that fulfills its dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices. But as you have explained, most of the inflation we're experiencing right now can be traced back to supply chain issues related to the pandemic. And the Fed cannot directly affect <clears throat> supply side conditions. These supply chain constraints seem likely to only significantly increase as Russia invades Ukraine. And the full effect of our sanctions take hold. If the Fed's tools are mostly useful in stimulating or constraining demand, how can we expect monetary policy to rein in inflation that is largely driven by supply side factors? Um, our policies really cannot, as you point out, affect supply side conditions. Our, our policies affect, affect demand. What we're facing now is, though, an elevated level of demand in, in the face of supply side constraints, and it's the collision of those two things that's creating inflation. So there is an important job for us to move away from these very highly stimulative monetary policy settings 
to a more normal level of, of rates and perhaps tighter uh, at a time when inflation is highly elevated, and, and that is what the committee uh, plans to do. So it seems clear that the Fed has limited tools to address inflation and that Congress has an important role to play. <clears throat> the Monetary Policy Report notes major shortages in housing supply as a factor in high prices. If Congress were to make investments to alleviate these shortages, do you think this would be helpful in, a, in addressing inflation? Major investments in housing supply? So I, I, think, I think housing prices are, um, are high for a number of reasons, actually. Uh, difficulty in getting lots, materials, uh, difficulty in, in finding workers, very high demand. It's been extraordinarily high. So those are, those are many of the, of the features. And also low interest rates have made credit widely available. Um, mortgage rates are going up. That will probably begin to cool off demand. Uh, I wouldn't want to comment on uh, on uh, congressional legislation, but uh, I do think there's no doubt a role uh, for Congress. So I suppose I could conclude uh, without having you comment directly on fiscal policy that you agree there are ways to manage inflation outside of monetary policy. It's not only monetary policy, that others have a role to play. I, I do think that's right, but more in a sort of medium or longer term sense. I think. Um, the, the Fed does monetary policy, and inflation is largely a monetary uh, phenomenon, and it's our tools that can be used to address inflation. Over time, though, of course, uh, anything that expands the productive capacity of the United States over time would, uh, you know, in principle, uh, make greater, greater potential output and uh, a less constraining economy. Fed forecasters expect that inflation will subside as supply chain disruption issues are resolved. However, housing and rent prices, as you've said, account for roughly one third of the consumer price index, and most economists do not expect the problem to be resolved as quickly as supply chain bottlenecks due to both the time it takes to develop housing and the lack of investment in housing that is affordable to low and moderate income families. Currently, there's a shortage of nearly 7 million rental homes that are affordable and available to America's lowest income renters and a shortage of more than 5 million homes for potential home buyers. In my district, there's a shortage of more than 34,000 rental homes that are affordable and available to the lowest income families, while the state of California has a shortage of more than 962,000 affordable rental homes. Homes. If Congress does not make the investments to increase supply and access to the affordable homes in this country, how concerned are you that the Fed will not be able to contain inflation? Well, you're right that uh, housing inflation is a significant part of the, uh, of the CPI. We, we also look uh, more prominently at, at personal consumption, PCE, which is a different measure, and it's some, something less than that. Um, and, and unlike these uh, temporary supply side constraints that we see, housing inflation really is much more of an indicator of the tightness of the economy rather than supply side problems. So it's something we watch carefully along with wages, frankly, and uh, it, it, it is a major contributor to inflation. As, as I mentioned, higher interest rates do, it, it, housing is a very interest sensitive sector, and higher interest rates, really interest rates that move back toward a more normal level should act to cool off the housing market over time. Thank you. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is the ranking member of the committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Powell, Chair, Chairman Powell, thank you for your leadership in tumultuous times. And this is certainly uh, uh, interesting times internationally, challenged times internationally. Um, everyone else on the open market committee, it seems, has opined about the March meeting. Everyone, um, whether it's a tweet or an interview or anything else. What are your thoughts going into the March meeting? The March meeting. <clears throat> okay, so here's how, here's how I'm thinking about the March meeting. And I guess I would start, of course, with the U.S. economy, which is very strong, the labor market extremely tight, and inflation running well above target. Um, the way we think about our work is we develop working plans for making adjustments to monetary policy <clears throat> over the course of the coming months, and then we are flexible as plans meet the real world. So 
we're never on autopilot, obviously, uh, and at a time like this, what we aim to do is lay out our principles and then, with whatever clarity we do have, and then proceed to implement them, those policies carefully and nimbly. So coming into this meeting, let's say before the Ukraine uh, uh, invasion, the committee was set to raise our policy rate, the first of what was to be a series of uh, raise, raises expected for this year. Every meeting was live. Decisions would be based on incoming data and the evolving outlook. I also expected we'd make great progress on our plan to begin to shrink the balance sheet. And so the question now really is how the invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing war, the response from nations around the world, including sanctions, may have changed that expectation. And so uh, it's too soon to say for sure, but for now I would say that we will proceed carefully along the lines of, of that plan. The, the thing is, the, the economic effects <clears throat> of these events are highly uncertain. So far, we've seen energy prices move up uh, further, and those increases will move through the economy and push up headline inflation, and also they're going to weigh on spending. We've, we're seeing effects on, on other commodities uh, and perhaps from declining risk sentiment and weak, weaker growth abroad. The thing is, we, we can't know how large or persistent those effects will be. That simply defends, depends on events to come. So. This is where that leaves me. I do think it will be appropriate to raise our target range for the federal funds rate at the March meeting in a couple of weeks, and I'm inclined to propose and support a 25 basis point rate hike. We're also gonna write down our new summary of economic projection, individual forecasts, which will show each participant's views of the, of the path forward in the economy and with rates. I also expect that at this meeting, <clears throat> we'll make good progress toward an agreement on a plan to shrink the balance sheet we will not finalize that plan at this meeting. We'll do that when we think the time is right at a coming meeting. The bottom line <clears throat> is that we will proceed, but we will proceed carefully as we learn more about the implications of the Ukraine war for the economy. We use our tools to support financial stability and macroeconomic stability. We're gonna avoid adding uncertainty to what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain moment. So that's, that's how I would think about it. Very specific. <clears throat> Now, you mentioned 25 basis points uh, from all the analysis about what the Fed will do over the course of the next year. Uh, is 25 basis points the floor, the ceiling? Is it the speed limit? Uh, is that the max you think the, the Fed could, could, uh, could take on? How do you think of that? So here, here's how I think about that. <clears throat> we have an expectation. Those of us on the committee have an expectation that inflation will peak and begin to come down this year. And to the extent inflation comes in higher or is more persistently high than that, then we would be prepared to move more aggressively by, by raising the federal funds rate by more than 25 basis point at a meeting or meetings. Um, now, you mentioned the balance sheet, a plan for the balance sheet, um, and that, that is to come. Um, but what I'm hearing clearly from you is that the Fed is very interested in financial stability given what's happening, and you're willing to make quick decisions on a question of liquidity, on a question of market stability, that those important works that, that you've focused on as, as Fed chair. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is a, it's actually substantial news for, that, for the House to, to be the first rather than the Senate to break news. So uh, thank you for your forthcoming uh, well, being so forthright about uh, your views on this. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for ranking member holding this hearing. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you very much for being with us here once again. Uh, as we look at the unprovoked criminal Russian invasion of Ukraine, one of the most notable national security responses has been the president's recent announcement to cut off much of the Russian financial sector from SWIFT financial services. Our EU partners have also joined us and excluded seven Russian banks from SWIFT. Chairman Powell, what practical effect would this have on Russia, its economy, its financial sector, and its people? So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I should point out that um, uh, the Fed does not impose sanctions on other countries, that, that we, uh, in this uh, process of, uh, of developing sanctions, we are not a principal 
that's really a job for the administration, particularly the Treasury Department. So we, we provide technical background support and things like that. But I think questions about sanctions and their effects generally would be more for the administration and the, and the Treasury Secretary. I think you can see, I will just add, though, that the effects of the sanctions so far appear for now to have been significant. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw what happened to their the ruble, we saw what happened to their market, the market still closed. Um, is a way around it for them cryptocurrency? Could you talk a little bit about that? I know it's a little bit out of your bailiwick, but as you said, these are it's an interesting moment in time. You know, we, we haven't had to face this since really World War II, and even all the comments that you made about inflation and watching the market, so much of it is tied to obviously what the Russians are doing with respect to their Un, uh, unwarranted and criminal act there in Ukraine. So I, I don't have any <clears throat> private information on, on the extent to which that is happening, but that is something you read about and hear about. Uh, and I just think it, it underscores the need really for congressional action on digital finance, including cryptocurrencies. We, we have this burgeoning industry which, uh, which has many, many parts to it. And uh, there isn't in place uh, the kind of regulatory framework that needs to be there. It was probably no different with railroads or telephones or the Internet. And ultimately, uh, what's needed is a framework, and in particular, um, uh, ways to prevent these unbacked cryptocurrencies from serving as a vehicle for terrorist finance and just general criminal behavior, tax avoidance and the like. Uh, so uh, th I guess that's what I would say there. I don't really know the extent to which it's happening, although we do, you do hear that and read it in the paper. Seems like an out for him since we did go down this road. Could you comment a little bit about then the central bank digital currency? It seems like that would be something that would be helpful in situations like this. Yes, yeah, so we, <clears throat> we issued a paper after much thought and many drafts. We issued a paper... Um, was it late last year? I guess it was late last year, um, seeking public comment on uh, the costs and benefits of a potential central bank digital currency uh, issued by the Federal Reserve here in the United States, digital dollars. And we await, I think we gave a, a, an extended comment period, and we, we, um, we gave, and we very much look forward to reading those comments. This will be something that we invest a, a fair amount of time and expertise and uh, hiring people and things like that to try to get it right but also to understand whether the benefits actually outweigh the costs, which I think is an unanswered question both here and around the world. Nonetheless, it's our obligation to, um, to move vigorously to understand the answers to, the, to that question so that we can deploy a central bank digital currency if it's appropriate. I, so would it, uh, you know, in principle, it depends on we, why people are using unbacked uh, digital currencies. If they're using them to evade, uh, you know, uh, visibility, uh, and evade the law, then for us just to have a law-abiding CBDC won't won't change that. They'll still be able to use those those currencies for that matter. The existing uh, digital currencies that that again are not backed are really vehicles for speculation. They don't they're not used in payments. They're not a store of value. They're speculation like gold. <clears throat> That's what they're used for. Um, whereas uh, you know potentially a U.S. CBDC would have a wider view. I do want to stress we have not decided to do it. But we do understand our obligation is to is to really get to to the bottom and understand both the uh, technical and the um, policy issues that that uh, need to be answered. Thank you, and I know my time's about up. I'd just say from your lips to God's ears, I hope that the inflation does peak this year and does come down because people are hurting. And thank you very much again for your your steady thank stewardship. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Welcome, Chair Powell. Uh, it's good to see you in the chair. We appreciate your time and service. Chair Powell, since the last FOMC meeting in January, uh, the global economy has become markedly more complex. Russia's unprovoked and unwarranted invasion of Ukraine has led to a very steep increase in the price of energy. As of this morning, when I checked, uh, a barrel of crude oil was priced at $112 per barrel. And, uh, you know, this, this steep increase in the price of energy, risk-pushing U.S. inflation, uh, 
potentially even higher. How does, and you've touched on it a little bit, but how does the war in Ukraine affect your thinking as you prepare for the next FOMC meeting? So um, I think the first thing, again, to say is that the, the um, ultimate economic effects of the war and all of the, the sanctions and events yet to come are just very highly uncertain, and we need to, we need to understand that. And um, so, as I mentioned, I think it's appropriate, appropriate for us to move ahead. Inflation is high, the committee is too high, and the committee is committed to uh, using our tools to bring it back down to levels of price stability, which is to say 2% inflation. So, uh, we, but I would also say that given the, the current situation, we need to move carefully, and we will. And we'll be nimble, we'll, we'll be looking at the situation as it evolves, and, and again, we will use our tools to add to financial stability, not to uh, create uncertainty. And so at this so, point in time, you don't think that it significantly alters your expectations for the rate increases that you've discussed this year? I, I don't think that's knowable yet. I mean, so we've run, well, what we do, what we like to do is run alternative scenarios, and we've done some of that, as you would expect. And, you know, you, it's easy to find cases where, where, where it would affect, but we don't know that yet. We honestly don't. And Chair, uh, we'll see. Thank you. Chair Powell, yeah. could you explain the role of the Federal Reserve in implementing U.S. sanctions on Russia, are you working? How you're working with OFAC? How this actually is implemented? Right. So, it, sanctions are really designed by uh, the administration. They, they, they're they're part of what the elected government does. Where we provide technical technical support, um, we implement those sanctions, or we, we make sure that that they that the banks obey them. That we supervise and regulate. That's that's one thing that we do. We also consult on. You know, we have knowledge about financial markets and financial institutions. So we're 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 providing technical support, but we're not the decision makers on on those things. Um, and, and honestly, these are decisions that are made at the at the level of the government, not at the level of the elected government, not at the le level of the Fed. And I know things are are happening quickly and in real time here. But what actions has the Fed taken to date since the invasion of Ukraine? Well, I, I'd say first of all, since since um, you know late last year. We've been on very high alert mm -hmm. uh, for cyber attacks. We haven't really, we haven't seen any any notable incidents about that yet. We consult, we, you know, we're we're making sure that the banks we regulate and supervise are also on high alert. We communicate with the reserve banks where there's a lot of expertise in these areas and other parts of the government. So that's that's one thing that we've done. Um, I mean, you know, we're as I mentioned, uh, we we, uh, we 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 are in very close contact with. The Treasury Department, as you would expect, at, between every central bank and every finance ministry around the world. Um, but again, we're not the ones who design the sanctions. Right. Well, cyber cybersecurity is uh, certainly this committee is, uh, and especially at the Fed, is a top priority. I'm glad that you're watching it closely. Chair Powell, does our U.S. financial system have the necessary capital and liquidity to handle any economic fallout from this war? What kind of data? Will we be seeing? I mean, the evidence to me strongly suggests that the answer to that is yes. We we just went through a um, rather enormous shock with the pandemic and the near closure of the global economy, and and U.S. banks' capital levels are at multi-decade highs, liquidity levels the same. Um, it's hard for me to look at that and, and say that a lack of capital is a th is a threat at this point. There are there are certainly issues, you know, cyber against cyber for private financial institutions. Is, is a huge issue and one that uh, they spend a great deal of time on, as do we. In, in 2015, the Obama administration blocked the development of the Keystone XL pipeline, a decision reversed by the Trump administration, and President Biden canceled the permits, again, depriving the U.S. of over 800,000 barrels of oil a day. Wouldn't expanding the supply of oil by 800,000 barrels a day reduce energy inflation and lower prices at the gas pump? We, we don't, we're not responsible for energy policy. That's, that's a matter for Congress and the administration. Uh, of course, the laws of supply and demand do, do work. Laws of supply and demand do work. I've, I've used my time and I yield back. Gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Chair Powell 
And I'd like to first recognize uh, one of my senators from all the way from Guam, Senator James Moylan. Thank you so much for making time to join us here today, Senator. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, um, over the course of the, um, the uh, uptick of inflation in the last year, you uh, testified before the committee on multiple occasions that uh, the Fed believed that the inflation that the country was experiencing was transitory. And since that time, especially today, there's a seeming change in, in that tenor. Could you elaborate more on that? Sure, I'd be glad to. So I, I think very widely among macroeconomists and other central banks around the world, we looked at it as akin to an energy shock and in the, the, a supply side shock. And the textbook on monetary policy would have you look through that because a supply shock comes and goes. And if by the time monetary policy is having its, its effect, which happens with long and variable lags, we think, uh, the supply shock is already gone. So we looked at it that way. And I, you know, um, I think that we, we expected to get relief, particularly going into last fall, I would say. We expected when schools reopened, vaccinations you know, raised, uh, you know, kids back in school, we, we expected supply of labor to come in, that kind of thing. And it didn't happen. It, but it, so, but, it, but it, it didn't happen because the supply side constraints didn't ease. They didn't ease. So it's not like, it, it, as a practical matter, what was wrong was not the theory. It was just, in reality, the supply side constraints have been much, much uh, more durable and persistent than we had expected. So we, we, we knew that we could be wrong. And I think we always thought, I always thought we could pivot pretty quickly and catch up. And you know, we did pivot when we, we started to pivot in the middle of last year and then pivoted hard at the end of the year. But in the meantime, the economy was was uh, really healing incredibly quickly over the second half of last year. You know, re record job growth and record decline in unemployment, record tightening in the labor market. So, um, you know, we we know that what our job is now, which is to which is to move away from these highly accommodative settings to uh, more appropriate settings, given the, the the very hot nature of the labor market and the level of inflation. There's, um, there's chatter, um, Mr. Chairman, public chatter, that uh, the intensity of the inflation that we're dealing with today is a, is a reflection of um, the Fed not taking policy action soon enough, not taking enough policy action. And there's chatter, public chatter, that, that uh, causes the Fed's credibility to come into question as to whether or not it is acting responsibly and appropriately with the data sets that are coming in. And I bring this up, Mr. Chairman, because we have a duty to the American people to be able to raise these questions as pointed as they are and to give uh, individuals such as yourself an opportunity to really speak to the credibility question that's really um, out there in the community. If you could elaborate further on that. Sure. It's for others to judge many of the things you, you mentioned, and we understand that. But so um, we, uh, starting in December at our December meeting, we, we began talking about significantly more rate increases. The market uh, took us very much at our word, and as this year has gone on, the market is, has, you know, mar so market participants do appear to be reacting, you know, what I would call as appropriately to, uh, to our assessment, our ongoing assessment and reassessment of, of, uh, of what's appropriate. And, um, you know, I I'll just assure you and, and everyone that we are committed to achieving price stability. We will use our tools to achieve price stability. Really, that is an essential bedrock element of everything else we want to achieve in the economy, including a strong labor market. When um, we faced the financial crisis in 2008, a lot of lessons were learned about the need for the Fed to be more responsive to the um, liquid liquidity traps that could take us by surprise. Um, given the circumstances we're dealing with today and the frustrations that the American people are facing, can you share with us any lessons that the Fed has learned with, resp with respect to its responsiveness to the inflation that we've been dealing with over the past 12 to 18 months and, and the intense inflation that we're dealing with today? So the, the inflation that we're experiencing is, is just nothing like anything we've experienced in decades. It's, um, it's, it's higher, of course, much higher than anything we've seen since I was much younger. Um, but, but not only that, it's different. You know, it's coming from the goods sector. The goods sector has been a source of disinflation for a quarter of a century because so many goods, so many manufactured goods have been uh, but, but just specifically, Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, what specific lessons has the Fed learned from the outcome that we're dealing with today? 
Well, I mean, we're still living through it. So the, 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 main, the main focus we have is not on doing a, you know, a retrospective. It's on <clears throat> conducting policy appropriately, appropriately to return us to price stability while also sustaining the expansion. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chairman Powell. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on your nomination to continue your job for a second term. I think it's well-deserved. Before I get to my questions, though, I want to hold up something here. This is a Ukrainian dollar. It's, it's a grivna. I kept some of these when I was in uh, Ukraine several years ago doing some ministry work, and I think it's interesting to think that what happens in the next few days may determine whether this is another defunct piece of currency and the nation returns to a ruble or will this maintain some of its value but as you look at it you can see it's a fraction physically a fraction the size of the u.s dollar um, it takes about 30 of these grievances to match a u.s dollar but when you look at, at values this, uh, our dollar has decreased in value, as, as you have mentioned, due to inflation. Now, a year ago when you testified before this committee, I asked what your outlook was for the economy, and you said you expected economic growth to be strong for the rest of 2021. But at that time, I warned that the $2 trillion stimulus bill that was making its way uh, through Congress at that time was unnecessary and far too big, given the economy was already recovering. Lo and behold, these predictions came true. Uh, in your opening statement, you mentioned that you didn't expect inflation to continue at the rate it is right now, but I also recall throughout uh, 2021, we heard that inflation was slight, it was gonna be temporary, but I also understand that that prediction probably didn't include the actions and the roles that Congress had, as, as you had said. Now. According to a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, because the American Rescue Plan was so extremely large and was passed when the economy was already recovering, this was a significant contributing factor to inflation. Do you agree with that report from uh, San Francisco's bank um, that, the, that our reckless spending is a contributing factor to our inflation? I really, I wouldn't like to comment on any particular law, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, all of the things that we did after the pandemic were we turned our dials as hard as we could. So did you, uh, you know, with the CARES Act and uh, the economy did benefit from from that. We have the strongest economy in the world now. Um, but, you know, part of that, no doubt, part of what we did and what Congress did without naming any particular laws is also part of the reason why inflation is high now. Right. So there are multiple contributing factors yes. to that, being reckless spending, which devalues our dollar, um, is one of those. And what we heard last night was that there is not going to be a change in the direction this Congress is going or the White House. Uh, it sounds like we're just going to repeat the same mistakes we made in 2021. Now, I know that you have the tools of adjusting the interest rate. Um, you mentioned uh, increasing 25 base points. Um, and you mentioned that it may be necessary to go higher. Understand that. Do you still think that inflation will be temporary? Um, and, and I believe that you said it would be uh, it would be short lived going forward because of, of resolving our supply chain issues. But since there are other contributing factors to that, are you anticipating that? Congress or the administration will undo some of the failed policies, uh, such as the, the spending policies and the suppressing of America's energy supply, which has been a significant con contributing factor. If, uh, let me rephrase that, if Congress and the White House does not change the policies of 2021 and continues down that same path, do you still believe that inflation uh, will stabilize, price, price stabilization will come this year? Well, um, first, we've, been, we've had this expectation, as you, as you all know, for more than a year, and it hasn't actually come true. So we're, we're, we're humble about the fact that we, we can't really call with any, any confidence the turn. But it does seem that this year we'll be withdrawing uh, policy accommodation. <clears throat> actually, a lot of the fiscal policy uh, spending has happened now. And so the, the impetus to growth will be declining and, in fact, negative from fiscal policy as it stands now. 
And those are things in just the, just the natural uh, improvement of supply chains and, and labor supply and things like that. Those are the things we're looking to for relief on inflation, hoping for. Very difficult to say when they'll happen. And, and you know, our job is to achieve price stability one way or the other. Okay. I see I'm running out of time. I've got several other questions, but I'll, I'll submit those for the record. Now, you'll back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, for this hearing. And uh, thank you uh, to uh, Chair uh, Pro Tempore uh, Powell for joining us. It's been a challenging year. Rising prices at the gas pump and the supermarket cause real distress to working class families like my neighbors in Chicagoland. And improvements in employment and wages are real, but nearly not nearly enough. My constituents saw a decade of stagnation after the last recession. Working class Latinos and immigrants like my neighbors are always hard hit. We simply can't afford uh, that again. Uh, Chair uh, Powell, you've said that inflation has been driven by bottlenecks in the supply chain. And last night, President Biden highlighted their role uh, in car uh, corporate concentration and price increases. I'll note that uh, CEOs from Kimberly Clark to Tyson Foods have bragged to investors about their power to raise prices without facing competition. And last night, uh, President Biden said, and I quote, lower your costs, not your wages. And my constituents were glad to hear that. So Chairman, uh, can you explain how raising interest rates will lower prices for diapers or chicken? Last time it was because my neighbors lost their jobs and couldn't find diapers or uh, chicken. So uh, is that the idea? Well, the, the idea is that right now um, the, the federal funds rate is still set close to zero, and that is a very stimulative um, level. I think it's eight basis points today. Uh, so uh, that, that is not an appropriate level, we think, going forward. We think it's appropriate that we engage in a series of rate increases over the course of this year and also let our balance sheet shrink. And, um, so what will happen then over time is demand will moderate as interest rates get into the economy over time. And these annual price increases in everything uh, th th where prices are going up will moderate as well. That is how it, is, how it has always worked with, with interest rates. We, we don't do competition policy, so I, I can't really comment on uh, you know, uh, that part of it. But I will say that... Um, that's how we think about inflation, and that's how we use our tools to get inflation under control. Uh, changing gears, we discussed corporate concentration, and last July, the president uh, issued an executive order on competition that encouraged the Fed and other regulators to increase scrutiny of bank mergers. It's been a long time since regulators blocked a bank merger, even an acquisition by a globally uh, systemically important bank, or GSIB, in 2020. Uh, Chairman uh, Powell, do you think it's appropriate to issue a moratorium on pending mergers while the Fed updates its framework for their review? Well, I, I think we have a statute that Congress has passed that gives us um, the rules for evaluating potential uh, acquisitions and mergers by banks. I think we have a widely uh, developed framework for, for that work, and we're continuing to implement that. Um, I mean, any changes that would come uh, would, e would either come through legislation or, or through new personnel uh, at the Fed, uh, neither of which we have right now. As we uh, learned from uh, Wells Fargo, frontline bank workers are an important resource for regulators. They see firsthand how banks implement or ignore internal controls, and they can identify problems as they develop. Incorporating frontline workers' voices in our banking regulatory system would improve the information we have and diversify the voices that get heard. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, will the Fed commit to adding bank workers to your various advisory councils? Why or why not? Very interesting question. We, we, we do have... Um quite a diverse group of people on our various advisory councils, including people uh, who are 
representatives of workers. Um, I, I don't know that it's, we don't really, I don't know that we have ones that, that work councils, outside councils that advise us on bank supervision per se, but we do always seek out in all of our, in our reserve bank boards and also the, the, the advisory councils that we do have representation from, from labor and, and also from <clears throat> people who live and work in uh, and represent the interests of, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, low and moderate income communities. Thank you, I appreciate it if you would consider that. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kostop, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Chair Powell, for attending this morning. If you can, uh, a lot of times we look for historical references when we try to reference an event, a current event. Uh, a number of people, a number of pundits, when they look at inflation today, they reference it back historically to the late 70s and the early 1980s. From your perspective, is that the proper historical reference to what we're experiencing today as it relates to inflation? That's the proper historical reference for what we're, <clears throat> what we're trying not to replicate. Um, so we look back, um, look, obviously all of us have looked at carefully at the history of, of um, post-World War II uh, inflation and business cycles and all that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that's different now is that um, central banks, including the Fed, are very squarely take responsibility for inflation. That was actually not the case in the 1970s. There was a, a school of thought that really uh, there were certain things that, that an independent agency just couldn't do because it was too hard and Congress should do it. So now I think Central banks around the world have an inflation target. They have transparency so that they can be held to account for it. You know, we're, we're not waiting. We are using our tools now to, and that, that's, that's really different um, where, that, than it was in the 1970s. So also inflation expectations have been anchored for a long time. They, they really weren't then. They were allowed to become unanchored without, without much of a response. That, that would not happen in today's world and will not happen. A few weeks ago when the CPI number came out, I was on my way to a breakfast meeting in Jackson, Tennessee, where I represented one of my constituents and I, when we were talking about the new CPI number, he said, uh, I don't care what the number is because uh, I know that I'm paying 50% more in gas than I did 12 and 18 months ago. I know I'm paying 20 to 25% more in grocery prices than I did a year ago. I know what the price of a new car and a used car is. If you, if you were me, if you were a member of Congress, what would you tell your constituents about the rising cost, the expensive cost to, to just live today? Inflation is too high. It's, we understand that, and you know we're working on it. It's going to take some time, but we're going to get it back under control. By the way, we're seeing this everywhere in the world. We're seeing it more in the United States because our economy is stronger, but we're seeing it everywhere in the world. Let me, if I can, follow up on a, a few questions that, that some of my colleagues asked about. Uh, Ranking Member McHenry asked you about the, the next meeting and your plans for the, for the next Fed meeting, and I think you eloquently laid it out, but you also talked about the situation that's developed in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, my, uh, my inference from your answer was is that uh, if Russia had not invaded Ukraine, that the Fed would be more aggressive as it relates to the balance sheet and to rate hikes. Is that a proper inference? No, I think that remains to be seen. We, as I said, we are moving ahead <clears throat> at this meeting. It would be my expectation in two weeks with a, with a rate increase. And we're going to make progress on, on, on agreeing on a plan at this meeting to, to shrink the balance sheet, and I'm confident we will. The question of when we implement that plan is not answered yet. So I, I don't think that's clear at this point. Right. It's certainly a, a, you know, something that we can't answer now. Um, Mr. Garcia referenced the President's State of the Union remarks last night. The President, uh, when he talked about addressing inflation, said that we need to control cost. Did you hear him say that? I, I did not. I, I, did I, was, you, I was too busy getting ready for this hearing. I did not watch. I won't tell the President. <laughs> I probably just uh, when, when the President said he wants to uh, control cost or that businesses should control cost to address inflation, would you have any idea what he's talking about? I, I really can't comment. Um, Fair enough. In follow-up to my uh, questions from um, 
Congresswoman Wagner, she asked you about cyber. I know pre-pandemic, pre-invasion, pre uh, one thing that you talked about that kept you up at night was a cyber attack. If, if Russia were to retaliate against the United States in some form of a cyber attack, what degree of confidence do you have in our nation's banks to thwart a cyber attack from Russia? <clears throat> what I can tell you is that everything that we can do to protect ourselves against cyber, we're doing it. You know, we're really, we're doing it. The private uh, large financial institutions are doing it. They have been for some time. So I have, it's very hard to, to say what's possible to happen, but um, we're, we're certainly on, on high alert and we will continue to be. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, is now recognized for five minutes. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Lady uh, Waters, for your leadership in calling this hearing. Mr. Powell, first I want to say that at a time when we are still recovering economically from the COVID pandemic and we're facing challenges at home and now in Ukraine, I, I, I think and I feel deeply that the Fed should not be subjected to political stunts in the Senate with boycotts by the Republicans, and the Senate should consider the pending Fed board nominations as soon as possible. Uh, the Fed has an important job to do, and President Biden has put forward uh, qualified nominees, and, and we need to get uh, this done. Uh, so that's just my main point. Uh, with that said, as you and I have discussed in the past, the economic recovery has, been, uh, has not been even, and we still have a ways to go to ensure our economy works for everyone. Just as one example, the black unemployment rate remains at nearly 7%, which is more than double the white unemployment rate. And uh, later today, the Select Subcommittee on Corona Crisis is having a hearing where we will be looking at the, uh, the, the depth of the, of the pandemic's impacts on uh, child care providers and workers and the results that that has on our families and our economies. So I want to ask you about the monetary policy report the Fed released on Friday. The Fed notes that the labor force participation rate remains well below estimates uh, of its longer run trend as a result of retirement and people out of the labor force and engaged in caregiving activities. From both a macro perspective and a micro perspective, what does this drop in labor force participation mean for the U.S. economy and what does it mean for those workers who leave the workforce to care for their children or family members? Well, having, <clears throat> having a lower labor force participation rate now, it's about a little more than a percentage point lower than it was it reflects a lot of retirements, and um, you know what it means is that our labor force is smaller. That has consequences, including it's contributing to the labor shortage uh, that we're seeing across across industries all across the country. Um, if we if we had a few more million people working, then we wouldn't be feeling that quite so much. It also means the potential output of the country is lower. Um, Many of the people who are not in the labor force are, are, are retirees who have made a choice, but some of them are still people who, um, who want to come back but perhaps can't because of child care activities or fear of COVID or, or other factors. In any case, it's been uh, the, the, the decline in labor force participation that we've seen has been much larger than that of, of other comparable nations. And it was not something we expected, and it's certainly something that's now contributing to wage inflation and, and actual inflation and, um, and to the labor shortage that we're currently seeing. Oh, thank you. It, it's been announced as a, as a result of the Ukraine war and other uh, disagreements that Russia and China are now uh, moving to trade completely in their currency, no longer using the dollar. And... Uh, uh, Pakistan has flown in to meet with Russia. There's some talk that they may be part of it. Uh, what effect would that have on the U.S. economy if China and Russia no longer use the dollar in certain block trades around the world and with each other? What effect, if any, would it have on our economy? Well, we do benefit from being the reserve currency for um, 
the main reserve currency for the world. And that really is because we have open capital accounts and the rule of law, and uh, we have inflation, you know, over a long period of time uh, under control so that the, the dollar preserve, cons you know, preserves its value. And so our markets are the most liquid, and it's the place where people want to be. Over time, um, uh, the question is, if, if some want to move away from the dollar, what will be the effect on us? I don't think it's something you would feel right away. Over time, uh, they would have to create an e e ecosystem, economic ecosystem, whereby another currency becomes, uh, uh, you know, a better, a better currency for them to use. Um, you know, what we can do is we can make the dollar the most attractive currency by continuing to have the rule of law. And, and open capital accounts and, and make it an attractive place for people to invest and to use in their businesses. There, there wouldn't be any short-term effect of that over time, though. Um, you know, it would, it, would, uh, it would, I suppose it would diminish our, our, our status as the reserve currency. It's also possible to have more than one large reserve currency, and there, are, um, uh, there have been times when that was the case. And so it's not really clear. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to continue uh, several points that a number of my colleagues have raised, as Putin's aggression in Ukraine has continued to escalate, the U.S. and its allies have responded in a unified voice to condemn Russia and apply economic pressure. Chairman Powell, could you discuss the difficulty of predicting what the implications will be of locking Russia out of SWIFT? So again, the, uh, on sanctions, we're, we're not the, um, the right uh, folks to ask. We're, we, don't, we don't design them. We don't, we don't uh, implement them. So um, it would be Let really a question this for way, the administration. Then. Let me word it this way. How sweeping do you foresee the ripple effects through the U.S. financial system? Is there an effect on us as those actions take place? Um, with with big actions like this, there they there may well be unintended and unexpected effects, and uh, hard to say what those might be. Um, in the economic sphere, you're you're seeing not not directly to your question, but we're seeing you know concerns over palladium and neon and corn and uh, and wheat uh, shortages of those potentially, um, but. So it would be it would be difficult to uh, to say exactly what what the effects could be over time. Uh, you know, our the United States, our financial institutions, and our economy do not have large interactions with the Russian economy. It, it's a relatively small thing, and it's gotten smaller and smaller in recent years. So I, there wouldn't be you know direct effects from these kind of things on the U.S. economy. It's hard to think what the second order effects might be. Thank you. You've answered my question. As Congresswoman Wagner touched on, the price of oil has continued to climb during the past year to its highest level in more than seven years. And we now see international banks appropriately shunning Russian oil, uh, even without energy sanctions. Could you describe the range of different scenarios the Fed projects, projections paint in regard to this? And along with that, how do you see this potentially impacting the already uh, rampant inflation issues? Well, um it, it, obviously, the, the price of oil depends on uh, events that haven't occurred yet. It really depends on where this goes going forward. We have seen prices move up, uh, including just in the last couple of days. And they moved up quite substantially since, if you go back three months before this incident kind of began, prices are up quite a bit. The effects are going to be passed through into gas prices into lower economic activity and into uh, inflation, headline inflation. And, you know, the, the larger the increase, the more, the larger the effect. But the question then will become, that's a price level change. Is that going to lead to repeated inflation increases at that time? And that, that is uh, not necessarily the case. And of course, we would use our tools to make sure that it's not the case. And of course, uh, representing the constituency I do, which is both oil and gas and production agriculture, we take very careful note of what those actions will affect, how they will affect world crude oil prices. And of course, the Ukraine being a very historic major grain producer, uh, my wheat people also are prepared to step up and match that. Uh, hmm. But it all underscores, I suppose, the increase in energy production in the United States and 
and supporting policies that will not penalize or drive capital away from domestic oil and gas production. That's more of an editorial on my part, Mr. Chairman, but I note that we stand ready in this country to replace resources that may not be available or affordable for the rest of the world, and uh, we just need a little incentive and encouragement from this side of the room to utilize those things. So my last question in the time I have remaining, the economy is currently operating in what I think we'd all describe as the very least massive economic uncertainty. And when you deal with this 40-year inflation, the supply chain issues, and the COVID-related issues, hopefully as we're in that final stage, can you elaborate on how critical it is for the health of the economic system to be reliable and to maintain uh, liquid markets so we can navigate through all of whatever lies ahead of us? Yes. Yeah, so I would say our, our markets have been functioning well. There's a great deal of liquidity out there. We have now, uh, between our swap lines and our, our repo facility uh, for other foreign central banks and our standing repo facility in the treasury market, we have institutionalized liquidity provision. And I think just the knowledge that that is there will help support good market function, which despite all this volatility, we, we still have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Business, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Water. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today. Uh, given what you said about the upcoming uh, meeting in March and the illegal invasion of Ukraine, how is the Fed coordinating with other central banks around the world and accounting for their actions when considering adjustment to interest rate policy here at home? So we, um, we're in uh, ongoing contact, it's fair to say, uh, with our major central bank colleagues. And actually, we have a meeting of, of all of them on, uh, on Monday morning, at seven, a virtual meeting at 7 a.m on Monday, so um, it's something that we do regularly. That said, we conduct monetary policy to achieve uh, you know, domestic objectives, specifically here in the United States, maximum employment and price stability, and that's what we use our tools for. But, uh, you know, it's, of course, uh, the foreign events are, are very much top of mind right now, and it's enormously helpful to understand the perspectives, particularly of the Europeans who are so much closer physically to, to what's going on. So. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an important channel for us. Thank you. And, and Chair Powell, last week, the Fed published its 2022 Small Business Credit Survey. Among other things, the report found that small business applicants that used online lenders for their financing needs reported more challenges with their lenders than did applicants at other sources. The top challenges faced by borrowers from online lenders were high interest rates and unfavorable repayment terms. Can you explain the report's finding and what it could mean for small businesses that utilize online lenders to satisfy their financing needs? So if I, if I recall that um, survey, it did, it, was, it did raise some interesting questions. And um, our people looked at it and, and actually saw differences in, um, in data gathering. So it's not clear that the, that the data in the two surveys was, was comparable. But uh, I, I do think it's, it raises interesting questions. And we'll be happy to we'll come back to your office on that. And it might raise interesting questions where we, uh, through legislation, could provide some relief and regulations so that um, small businesses are not shortchanged when it comes to the most important element for any small business, access to capital, affordable capital. Chair Powell, during public remarks last month, acting controller of the currency, Sue, stated that in the not too distant future, the OCC, Fed, and the FDIC will issue a joint notice of proposed rulemaking to update the Community Reinvestment Act. Does the Fed also believe a joint NPR is possible? And when do you expect it to be released? 
Yes, we do. Uh, we think that that will be ideal, and we're working very closely with the OCC and the FDIC uh, and to, to come up with a consensus uh, notice of proposed rulemaking reflecting all of the comments that we got on our advance notice of proposed rulemaking. I think the timing is soon. I, I, I wouldn't want to put a specific date, but I know that it, it, we're going back and forth, and it, it feels like we're getting very close. Great. Thank you. And Chair Powell, a note published by a Credit Suisse strategist over the weekend warns that a decision to exclude certain Russian banks from the SWIFT system, which I support, could result in missed payments and giant overdraft with significant consequences for money markets, thereby forcing the Fed and other central banks to intervene to enhance liquidity to upset missed payments. Do you see this scenario as likely? No, I don't see that as likely. Um, of course, we always, uh, we always appreciate uh, looking at different risk scenarios. But again, given the relatively modest exposure that our banks have to directly to Russia and given the existing tools we have to provide liquidity, um, I, I don't see that as a likely outcome. OK. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is now recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for taking time to uh, not only join us today, but your insight into uh, monetary policy. The uh, monetary policy report of February 25th, seemingly still hot off the press, uh, brings about, I think, a good review of the Fed's uh, analysis of where we are. And I know there's that temptation by members of Congress to hold you accountable for things which are not within your purview. But on page three, you talk about special topics. Page three of your uh, February 25th, 2022 monetary report. Special topics, low labor supply. Next, it goes to uh, several other issues, then supply bottlenecks. Uh, as a member of Congress from Texas, both of these are highlighted to me on a daily basis as I receive feedback. Uh, this is inflationary also. We have taken a bit of time with you to probe with you your ideas that I think you have professionally handled on behalf of yourself and the Fed, the issues related to energy. But the bottom line is we can't get people back at work. We find that turns into a low labor supply, and then we've got bottlenecks. These are all hand in hand, glove in glove together, in my opinion. I took a few minutes just now to look at the uh, labor unions and schools, teachers unions. Uh, but let's move to the federal government. Where is the federal government on their employees coming back to work now by OPM? I don't know. We're, you know, we're an independent agency. I'll tell you where we are, which was we're in the middle of that process. <clears throat> Probably closer I, to the beginning than the middle. I know you are, but you see, if they don't come to work, then others don't come to work. So I think your point and my point is well made. Uh, I, I believe that what we need is your robustness, uh, not just your acumen in these issues, and your robustness within the administration to actually uh, let them know that for this report, monetary policy to be correct, that you believe inflation is a short-term a meaningful hindrance on our economy, they're going to have to make meaning the White House policy. They're going to have to understand the what caused this. And I think that this administration, I think the Democratic Party, I think this Congress has made friends with inflation to encourage it. And that if your prognostication is going to come forth that we end this inflation, we're going to have to have serious changes because right now in Texas, which has been relatively open, um, I don't I don't see relief on the horizon. 
and I think that this administration, this Congress has a lot to do with it. So without chastising you, I meant to help you. I, I would like for your voice in this administration and within halls of Congress, perhaps doors that are shut, for them to understand that they have actually made friends with and are continuing inflation, whether it be with teachers unions or whether it be with OPM. And we've got to get serious about getting people back to work because as you tap down the amount of money that is put in the economy, as that moves, it's going to have to correspondingly have people that come to work that pay uh, taxes, that, that move the economy, GDP, as, as a term we used earlier today. It, it's shifting this big, massive uh, task. So you've almost got a, a whole 30 seconds left. Uh, but I'd like to, without defending yourself, to, to, to say to you, I'd like for your voice of reason, of prosperity, of future to come true as you would like. Did I ask you a question? Okay, I'm going to support you. I'm for you. How can we help you? I, I do think in the, <clears throat> honestly, we have the tools and we have to use them to, we will use them to get inflation under control. But to the extent we get help from the supply side, it'll make that job so much easier. It, you know, it's, it's about um, labor force supply. It's really about uh, supply constraints and shortages and that kind of thing. It's also about exogenous events like a war, which will drive up the price of oil and gas, and that'll get into into prices, certainly, uh, and, and we'll make sure that it doesn't provoke a cycle of inflation. Yeah, this is what happens when you have to rely on other people for your food, cheese, and energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sessions. You can help uh, Mr. Powell by asking your friends on the Senate side to confirm his appointment. <laughs> the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, who is also the chair of the House Agriculture Committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Powell, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you, Mr. Scott? I want to sound the alarm here this morning. And I want you to listen to me, and I want the nation to, because I'm the chairman of our House Agriculture Committee. And I'm very worried about this turmoil over in uh, Ukraine and Russia's violent, illegal, and criminal action that they're taking and the impact that this has on global trade and most importantly our own food security we could very well be on the verge of a hunger crisis all over this world i want to share with you some research and the nation so we can understand what this Ukraine-Russia situation is causing. Today, Russia alone is producing more than two-thirds of the 20 million metric tons of fertilizer used to grow corn and wheat around the world. One country producing 66% of the fertilizer that is needed. And when you combine Ukraine and Russia, also, these are the two largest exporters of wheat, corn, and barley, producing a quarter of the world's wheat in these two countries, making this impact a crisis of soaring magnitude when you have this much and these two countries are warring each other. So I want to sound the alarm on this. I want to ask you um, this question. I want to ask you, Chairman Powell, the disruptions and rising prices from these commodities will destabilize global food markets and threaten our food stability and social stability. 
So my question is to you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Powell, to what extent could these developments create a financial stability risk here at home and abroad? And what must we do? We can go without a lot of things in this world, but the one thing we cannot go without is food. And when you have this much of power on our food security for the world in the hands of these two countries warring with each other at this time. What can you do about it? Sir, I, I think your, your point is um, very well taken. And I think, um, it, you know, it's shipping, it's corn, it's wheat, as you pointed out, it's fertilizer. And we see that uh, getting into food prices and into the food supply just, just uh, in these early days after the sanctions have been put in place in the war, less than two weeks old now. Um, I, I really, the Fed doesn't really have the tools to address this. It, this is really a matter for Congress and, um, and, the, and the administration, I think. But you're, you're right to call attention to it. And I, I, do, think by, I, do, I do think that this um, is understood and, and understood that things that that help will be needed here. Well, I, di I just want to say that we cannot allow the world to get into this desperate situation. So I'm giving this as sort of a Paul Revere moment here. <clears throat> I'm not saying the British are coming, but I'm saying the Russians are already at the door and they could cause worldwide hunger. And I hope that free nations around the world can come together and realize that this is not just Ukraine's fight. It's our fight. And we have got to win this fight. And hopefully we can get more of our nations to come together and end this situation in Ukraine and Russia before it causes truly a worldwide war. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, Chair Powell, uh, when your former deputy, Mr. Quarles, came before the committee last May, I pointed out to him that uh, just a week before the April inflation rate had been reported at 4.2 percent, uh, about since 2009, the rate in March uh, 2021 had been only 2.6 percent. I asked him if we were paying the price for monetizing a huge federal debt. What the late Dr. Friedman and, and former Chair Bernanke both called helicopter money. Uh, Mr. Quarles told me that he didn't believe the Federal Reserve was monetizing the debt. Mr. Chair, look, looking back a year, does the Fed continue to deny that it has been monetizing the debt? And do you believe that uh, you should have acted before now to rein in the inflation rather than let it now exceed 7.5%, the highest rate since 1982? So um, I think by monetizing the debt, what that, what that means is for the, for the central bank to purchase the debt with the intention of holding it. Um, and that's not the intention of here. You know, we're about to start shrinking the balance sheet, and we will return the balance sheet to, you know, uh, a size relative to our economy that it, that it was before. So also that is not our, at all our intention. We purchase longer-term securities in order to like drive down longer-term interest rates to support economic activity. I'd also say that that's not really um, what we think of as the source of inflation. Admitting that inflation, proclaiming that inflation is far too high and that we are committed to using our tools to get it back down, it's really about um, very, very high demand particularly in the goods sector, related to, the, to a spending shift that happened in the pandemic, um, and, and supply constraints that, that we didn't foresee 
international supply chains, labor constraints, um, low labor force participation right across the economy. It's a very different kind of uh, inflation story than we've had in the past, but it's one that we have to deal with and we will deal with it. Uh, Chair Howell, when, when you appeared before this committee in March of last year, and I asked you to clarify uh, the purpose of the Federal Reserve collecting data and employing stress tests uh, related to climate change, uh, you assured us that the Federal Reserve would be collecting the information to help financial institutions learn about climate risk and wouldn't be using the information for regulatory purposes. In recent weeks, considerable controversy has emerged in the confirmation process to fill four vacant seats on the Federal Reserve Board. One of the nominees has a record of advocating for aggressive Federal Reserve regulation related to climate change, including actions that would regulate capital allocation away from fossil fuels. I uh, won't ask you to comment on the confirmation process, but can you continue to assure us that the climate data and stress test proposed by the Federal Reserve will be used for regulatory purposes and driving investment away from pr traditional energy sources here. Climate, we call them climate stress scenarios, and we haven't, you know, we're, we're actually just building the capability to, to do this, and the idea is not to use them the way that we use the, the, the tr traditional stress tests to set capital levels, in effect. The idea is more to allow financial institutions and also regulators to understand better you know, the extent to which and the ways in which uh, climate financial risks has any implications for the banks. That's the purpose of it. I I'll add, though, that um, it is not our job to, uh, to tell, we don't think, to tell banks which uh, legal companies they can and can't lend to, and, and I don't see that as an appropriate uh, role for us. I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, so that's an absolute, unequivocal, a guaranteed answer that uh, the data will not be used for regulatory purposes in any way whatsoever. I can just say that, first of all, we're not, we're not, um, we're not even doing the tests yet, uh, or scenarios yet, um, but it, certainly that's not going to be their construct. Uh, they're going to be, the construct will be what I said, which is to help us understand better, not to set capital or, or otherwise uh, uh, put further regulatory requirements on. Thank you so very much. I, I deeply, deeply appreciate that, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Powell. How are you? Fine. How are you? I'm good. And um, I just want to thank you. Um, you've been getting picked on on inflation. But I'd like to start with chart one of your book. I always ask about your charts because I love them. And chart one shows a tremendous growth in employment, as does chart two shows a tremendous drop in unemployment, the converse of it. And it's like uh, dropped from about 14% to 4%. Do you think that the Fed's monetary policy helped in reducing the unemployment rate? Yes, for sure. Okay. And, you know, two years ago, we were going into a pandemic, and you and I had a conversation about the potential for a worldwide recession of a magnitude we'd never seen. Did we hit that? Did we get that uh, recession? No, we didn't. And you may recall, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer. That's what I, so I look at things kind of in a, with the pessimist eye. I expected many, many bankruptcies. Did we have those? Did we have the bankruptcies that were, we thought we might get? We sure didn't. Okay. Do you have any idea uh, how much the gross domestic product has grown in the last year? I want to say, Five point something percent. Well, it's actually more than that. And one of your charts has that, uh, uh, I think it's on uh, page 23, chart 14. Uh, it's, it's went from um, 2020 to now, it went from less than 17 and a half 
trillion up to 20 trillion. So it's, it's uh, substantial, about, uh, you know, 15 percent. Now, I don't think it's that much, but it's substantial. Did we expect that when we went into COVID? You mean since the trough? Yeah. No, yeah. I was just giving you the last year. So, um, you know, as you know, we were looking at some really bad scenarios and hoping they wouldn't happen in the first half of 2020. Now, the, the Fed took some pretty dramatic actions, as did central banks around the world, did it not? Yes. Okay. And the uh, Congress, led by the Democrats, took some pretty substantial and dramatic uh, steps, including the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure bill, to build a better America and to help us get out of what looked like it could be a tremendous recession. Now, I'm, I could ask you, did it not? But I'm not going to lead you in that one. But what I do want to talk about is the fact that despite the one flaw that Republicans can find, which is inflation, we have lower unemployment, a bigger economy. Do you know how many other countries have higher inflation around the world than America? 64, according to trade economics inflation of country by country. 64. This is a worldwide phenomena, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. So I want you to take a look at a couple more of your charts, because I think these are probably the most important. And they are the median wage growth uh, found in chart C on page 12 and the change in the price index for personal consumption on the next page found on page 13. Uh, Diagram 8. According to your chart on uh, page 12, the bottom quarter of wage earners are, have had their wages increase by almost 9%. You see that? Yes. And the bottom, the next quarter, uh, by uh, 6 and a half, seven percent Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, and then you look over to the next page, and we're running, I think you said it, about 5, 5.5% five inflation. So wage earners in the bottom half are making more money than they are potentially, if I do the math, they're making anywhere 8, 9 percent against a 5 percent increase in cost. Now, it's not apples to apples, but wages are going up, are they not? So wages at, at the bottom, in the bottom quartile, have gone up in real terms. I, I do not think that's true for the second, third, and fourth quartiles, but it is true for the bottom quartile that their wages, nominal wages, have gone up higher, more than inflation. Okay. So last question. When you and I spoke at the beginning of this year, and my time has expired, I'll, I'll ask it to you later on. And I thank you uh, for your service, sir. I thank you for keeping us out of a recession. I think we built a better America by staying out of the recession. I yield back. Thank you so much. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, for coming here. And I also appreciate your book and the work. And, and frankly, just yet again, want to highlight the really heroic work that the Federal Reserve did uh, to create stable markets, uh, particularly in, in March and April of uh, 2020. Since then, of course, there have been a lot of uh, economic distortions, uh, one of which is the ongoing inability of uh, the Federal Reserve to stabilize its own balance sheet, which is now over $9 trillion. I appreciate Mr. Perlmutter uh, highlighting some of the good news. And frankly, I'm positive that he has previously operated a lemonade stand, because he can always turn something good out of the lemons. Um, but, uh, so there, there's, not, there's no good news, but the concern is that in the long term, this has come at the expense of sound money. And so just over a year ago, uh, I talked to you about sound money, and is the U.S. dollar represent sound money? Because many of us anticipated that inflation was not transitory, and uh, that, that the uh, quantity theory of money might have some impact on uh, inflation. So, in light of the fact that we have seen, uh, you know, substantial change in the rate of inflation now versus what was showing up then but was anticipated, do you still think that the U.S. dollar is sound money? 
And uh, either way, what are the threats to the U.S. dollar as sound money? The U.S. dollar is sound money, yes. Um, the threats to the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency uh, really um, in the near term are, are uh, to, to, to displace the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, if that's your question, you would need to have, you need to be a very attractive place to hold large amounts of reserves. It's really different than that because we are, we are probably still going to be the, the reserve currency since the world grades on a curve. And frankly, the planet's never had this much debt since World War II. So all of the countries around the world did similar things. We weren't even, we were, you know, the discipline of the Bretton Woods era was gold. Uh, I don't know that there's magic just in gold, but there is magic in discipline. So if you look at sound money being defined by a stable store of value, uh, an efficient means of exchange, and a trusted record of an account, you know, you've at least taken some dings on store of value. Um, and so as you've seen people uh, decide to filter transactions and develop technology and regulatory frameworks, that are intended to be able to filter transactions, it's not as trusted or efficient as a means of exchange or a record of account. And so those, those kinds of things, not so much do we do okay on the curve, but is it truly sound? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I fo followed the last part, but I, I do think that, look, inflation is indisputably too high. We are using our tools to bring inflation back down to levels of price stability, and we will accomplish that task. Longer term, the U.S. dollar is, you know, is easily the, 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 the best currency, and it's because of what I just said. It's also because of the rule of law and, and the fact that, um, uh, we're, you know, we're the incumbent, and we, uh, you know, as long as we observe the rule of law and keep the, 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 keep the dollar relatively, you know, keep inflation low and predictable, that will remain the reserve currency. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you, Chairman. And look, historically, uh, there have been multiple reserve currencies. And generally, uh, when something loses its status as reserve currency, it's not just because of other things that uh, unfold, but it's because the value is debased. And we can come up with fancy words like modern monetary theory or quantitative easing or, uh, you know, similar to quantitative easing, but not really the same. When the Federal Reserve's balance sheet's growing, in a way it represents the Fed as the lender of last resort. We're not constrained by the taxes we collect. We're not even constrained by the amount of money the world will lend us. We're constrained only by the will of Congress to uh, not spend more. And what are you going to do? Not cover the spending, the prolific spending uh, by Congress. So uh, moving on, just talking about you know the, the Fed's role, of course, stable prices is really one component. The other is uh, full employment. And I wonder if you think, in light of uh, Mr. Perlmutter's reference to chart two, if chart four, which is the labor force participation rate, trends the white, right way. And uh, as you link to the next thing as a regulator, there's a lot of pressure for you to do ESG. What can the Fed do and what does Congress need to do to strike those balances? With relative to ESG? Uh, and, and full employment. Well, full, full employment, I think um, most members of the F FOMC now think we are at labor market conditions that are consistent with, with maximum employment. With 60 percent labor force participation, 62? I mean, the, the maximum employment can never be higher than the level that's consistent with price stability. The gentleman's time has expired. I think we're at that level. Thank you. At least. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, who is also the chair of the task force on artificial intelligence, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to add to uh, Representative Perlmutter's list of your triumphs the record level of small business formation. And so I think that when you try to preserve the very strong economic recovery, I realize you have a dual mandate, but keep an eye on that one, too. It's one of the most important successes we don't talk about enough. Uh, do you remember the misery index? I do. Uh, yeah, and so that when unemployment uh, drops from 14% to 4%, so um, drop by about 10%, and then, and then the inflation goes from 2% to 7%, so up by 5%, uh, does that mean the misery index is increased or decreased? It would be decreased. So thank you for that. Um, uh, the, 
Now, you actually mentioned uh, the, repeatedly that the inflation problem was largely one of goods uh, and not so much one of demand or, uh, and also of labor shortage. And so, you know, can you make any rough estimate of what fraction of the inflation we're seeing was due to sort of those three effects? So I, I should be clear, there, inflation is also too high in the service sector. I wouldn't want to oversell that. But the, the real big change has been in goods, which had negative inflation or close to zero inflation for, for 25 years. Um, I, I don't have off the top of my head the ability to just tell you what the contribution of that is, but it's, it's big. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a significant part of it. It's a, a lot of it also the, the is, is uh, energy. Which is you know, which is not obviously a worldwide problem. Yeah, exactly. and so that this is you know, if you could get back a little, something a little more um, quantitative from from your staff on that, I'd just be Glad really interested in knowing yeah. your estimate. Um, now, in terms of the labor uh, shortage, you know, back in, in the days when um, we had a different Senate, uh, they passed comprehensive immigration reform that was then, of course, blocked by Republicans. And many studies at the time indicated it would be a huge positive for our economy to pass comprehensive immigration reform. And that was at a time which didn't have an extraordinarily tight labor market. Is there anything you can think of that would invalidate those studies that, uh, that showed that comprehensive immigration reform in both the low skill and the high skill sectors would be a huge plus if we if it was. If I can that. answer that this way, um, if you look back at the trend, let's say five years ago in that range uh, of immigration, legal immigration, people coming in, and uh, and look where we are now. We're now several million people, many of whom would be in the workforce short of that. So so lower immigration is definitely part of the story of the labor shortage. And I, but that's that's what I would say. Um, and so is there anything uh, quantitative you can say about the time scale for unwinding the balance sheet? You know, do you, do you think of this in terms of a fixed time scale that we want to go back to normal in the next two years, three years, or do you say we're going to take it down by, you know, 1% a, you know, 1% a month? Um, or do you, or you anticipate some sort of feedback loop where we look at the, you know, taper tantrums or the equivalent and sort of adjust it as you go? So the way, the way we did it last time is we, we set a, a cap on the amount that will run off, and anything above that gets reinvested for both MBS, mortgage-backed series, and for treasuries. We haven't had that discussion at the, at the committee. We will have it in two weeks. Um, and, but I, I guess it, it takes, um, it, it turns out that the level of the cap doesn't really matter that much for how long it takes, something in the range of three years to get back to uh, where you're trying to get to. And the way we define that, what is the end, the end we look at the size of the economy, the size of the banking system, and we ask, what's the level of reserves that we'll need at that point? And um, and so we 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 set we set a uh, you know a course for that place, and then as we arrive, start to get close to it, we might slow down a little bit, like as though it were a, you know an airplane, and and that's the way it will work. So, I, but I think something in the range of three years to get back to. Uh, what what the balance sheet needs to be, which is um, basically reflective of the public's demand for our liabilities plus a buffer, mm -hmm. and, and what we call ample reserves. Yeah. Do you have an estimate for how many uh, hours of your life have been spent attempting to explain the difference between quantitative easing and monetizing the debt to members of Congress? <laughs> no, sir. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, now, one of the most valuable functions of the Fed is to provide the emergency uh, assistance uh, to the financial systems of the free world. And it, you mentioned that you stood ready. Are there specific things you're worried about in Eastern Europe where the, couple, where the economies are very tightly, more tightly tied to Russia, uh, where you may really have to step in and get involved? Any specific worries? You know, what we're, what we're watching is sort of, the, you know, the global markets and the dollar funding market, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing markets that are functioning, but, and of course, we, we have tools and we have things in place to, to deal with stresses should they emerge. That's really what, what we're doing. Uh, and um, as, I, as I mentioned, markets are, 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 are functioning, so we haven't had to deploy any of those tools. Thank you, and my time's up, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and welcome, uh, Chairman Powell. Good to see you again. Um, you know, we've just we're in the middle right here of a really uh, disastrous situation with Ukraine, and you know, the, the part of the uh, approach to uh, 
kind of corralling the, the Russian uh, advance there is uh, on the financial side. And it would appear to me that we probably didn't do this as quickly as we should have. It didn't look to me like we had a plan. You know, if we really wanted to get involved financially, we should have been sitting here saying whenever, when they move the first battalion or regiment or whatever you want, amount of troops you want to talk about on the border, we should, should have said something, well, okay, if you move another one there, we're going to start doing things to you. And we didn't do that until they started to invade. And now, all of a sudden, we're playing catch up. So <clears throat> that begs the question, we know that China is watching all of these actions very, very carefully. They're looking at what Russia does, how we react, what we do, how the rest of the world reacts, what they do. Um, so to me, we need to be sitting here as a country, as the Fed, as congressional individuals saying, we need to be ready for the Chinese when they invade Taiwan, because I see no reason why they will not do that shortly. So if we don't prepare for that, shame on us. So my question to you is, are you beginning to think about what kind of actions you would take uh, or support or suggest to the administration should China uh, in, in take over Taiwan or attempt to do this? Because this is going to be a completely different scenario because of the size of China, the size of the military, the size of Taiwan versus uh, getting into Eastern Europe. So that's kind of a large question, but can you like to jump into it? Sure. So, um, you know, I mean, those questions are really questions that are dealt with at the National Security Council and the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies and the Treasury Department. Um, you know, we're interested students of, of all that, and we, we have our technical uh, expertise that we can contribute. But honestly, we're not, you know, Well, not. Mr. Chairman, now, I, I listened to you very carefully a while ago, and you made the comment that you're looking at making policy for anticipated situations in the coming months with regards to a number of things. What happens with the economy, what happens with inflation. And so if you're not doing that, I understand you may not want to tell me today because that would be helping the Chinese who are probably watching this right now. I understand that. But I just a, sort of wink and nod to say, yeah, we're looking at that would certainly be nice because it would give us a level of comfort to know that we're not going to be, you know, behind the, the eight ball again. Well, I mean, as I also mentioned, we do model alternative scenarios of various kinds, and um, you know, we in fact, with with every Teal book, which is our document that we use at the FOMC, we run half a dozen of them in, in great detail, and people study those, and it helps them think about alternatives. So I'll just leave it at that, if I could. Okay, thank you. I'll let you off the hook on that one. Um, with regards to inflation, we've talked about it significantly here today, and I think sometimes that you're giving way too much credit for it and giving way too much criticism for it. I think that there are a lot of things that are outside your control that happen that <clears throat> basically affect inflation that uh, you have to react to. Um, you don't make monetary policy from the administration side. You don't make legislative policy from the legislative side, and yet you have to react to all those things. So I had an economist. I, I'm the ranking on small business. I had economists come in to talk to our, our committee the other day. And I asked him to break down the different causes of inflation. And I said, well, let me identify at least what I think are four significant causes. One is money supply, the amount of money that's pumped in, either through Fed uh, actions or through our actions as Congress, uh, regulations, supply chain slash workforce situations, and energy. And he broke it down like this, and he had some charts, and he, he started going off, and I said, just give me the percentages. And so he's roughly 40% due to money supply, the money that goes in as a result of Fed actions or congressional actions, 20% regulations, 20% supply chain, and 20% energy. So <clears throat> if you look at that, and I know Mr. Foster, while I go, is looking for, for some answers, so hopefully I've, I've helped him with this question. Um, if, you, if you look at that, basically you don't have a lot of control over regulations, you don't have a lot of control over supply chain, and no control over energy policy. And money supply, if the Congress gets involved and passes these massive bills and throws a lot of money in there, you don't have control of that either. So the amount of control over this is, is probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 percent at best. So, you know, my, my concern is that when you say that you're trying to help things with, with inflation, it really balances, goes back to the administration and to us as Congress. You know, the administration, first thing they did was stop the pipeline, stop oil drilling, and prices went up. And so that right there is 20 percent. So it's, it's important, I think, that we understand that. I'd like for you to comment, if you would, just for a second. I'm running out of time. If you'd like to comment. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, interesting breakdown. Um, we can continue this discussion. I, you know, we would have a little different uh, assessment. I would just say though, we welcome. You know, we, this this is a lot about supply side issues, and, and we welcome any help we can get uh, on that. And we're looking for for help from improved supply side. Okay. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, you know, Douglas uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and Chairman Powell. Welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, before I uh, ask my question, a statement, they say one of the benefits of inflation is that uh, uh, you can. Uh, live in a more expensive neighborhood without moving. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was very interesting. That's a good one. Uh, statement I had seen, and I thought I would bring it to you, your attention. <laughs> you know, according to the recent analysis of uh, branch closures by the National uh, Community Reinvestment Coalition between 2017 and 2021, uh, banks have closed as many as uh, 7,000 branches across this uh, country, one third of which was in low income and moderate income communities, uh, neighborhoods of color. To what extent is the Fed uh, considering these banks does it, uh, as in contemplating which reform to implement and strengthen the Community Reinvestment Act and the importance that banks' branches play uh, for nearby communities? So I, I do think that's a focus of, of the CRA and also of the um, uh, focus that we want to strengthen in, in our uh, proposal that's it's out for comment. Uh, actually, it's, it's now. We've had the comments and we're getting ready to put a, a notice of proposed rulemaking out. But we do understand the importance of presence in the community and service to the community. And uh, those things do go into, um, into our CRA assessments. Okay. Mr. Powell, according to the, the latest uh, forecast from Goldman Sachs and the Federal Reserve, which uh, raised interest rate more than expected this year due to high inflation and labor market approaching full employment, can you speak more on this? Uh, should we uh, expect the Fed to raise interest rate at all several remaining policy, several remaining policy meetings uh, this year? Uh, and should we expect the Fed's uh, main rates to be by the end of this year so yes um, um, so the the um, inflation is is uh, running well above our target the labor market is extremely tight the economy is growing strongly and and our policy rate we do expect to move our policy rate up um, in a series of uh, of rate increases this year away from the very low setting that we put into place at the during the acute phase of the pandemic, and uh, to a more appropriate uh, level, given the um, the fast recovery and the strong recovery that the economy has had, given the fact that inflation is running so far above our target, we do expect that that will be appropriate. We've communicated that transparently and clearly, and markets have accepted it. And um, it, it is our plan to return to price stability while also supporting a continued expansion. Okay, and I want to make sure that I understood uh, the statement that was made earlier. And I know you had the opportunity to observe other inflations uh, that we've had. Uh, with wages going up, as they say, in the bottom half of making more uh, in earning, uh, do you consider that we are uh, in a better situation to deal with inflation that we have now compared to inflation in the past? I think that this inflation is is substantially higher than anything we've seen since I was in college, you know, 50 years ago. So, this is um, this is strong high inflation, and it um, it it's very important that we get on top of it, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I I would say this: the labor market is extremely strong. So, from this from that standpoint, I do think um, we're, we're in a we're in a good place. Uh, from the standpoint of trying to get inflation under control, uh, you know, uh, workers are still going to be getting good uh, good jobs and pay increases for some time, uh, uh, and uh, so the economy is strong, and that's that means the economy can take the rate increases that we're going to be making. Ultimately, we need to 
get demand and supply back in alignment so that we can get inflation back to a more appropriate level. Okay, thank you, sir. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, uh, Chair Powell. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm actually going to pick up on what my colleague from Florida was just talking about and add that to what uh, my colleague from Missouri next to me here was was talking about. And I, I'm going to. You may have said that the 40-20-20-20 uh, ratio that came from uh, Douglas Holtz Aiken, breaking that down about 40% of of inflation being tied to monetary policy and spending, 20% uh, to regs, 20% energy policy, 20% supply chain. You, you might disagree with that, is what you had said. But um, do you believe that spending has contributed to the situation of high inflation that we are in? Okay, thank you. So I, I may have misunderstood um, what, what the, your colleague said and about Madam Chair, I ask that you suspend. I think Mr. Lawson has his microphone on yet, and I, we're getting a little crosstalk. So if we can maybe uh, yeah, can, add a few seconds back here. Okay. Is the gentleman I'll muted I'll now? No, clearly is not. All right, I think you can resume. Okay. I'm just, I'd just like to... Uh, I would ask that you have a light gavel at the end of my time here. I think we were having yes. a little crosstalk, so we yes. have to go back on that. So, so I, I may have misunderstood. I thought that the 40% was, was money supply, but it, you made it sound more like a monetary policy. And, and so I, I, I would, um, I, look, I, I mean, look, we can discuss those numbers, but that, that, that's more, that makes more sense but to me. Point being, has, has spending contributed to inflation? Yes, I think a number of factors have, okay. including... All right, and, and, and I would agree with that. And, um, you know, frankly, many of us have sort of warned or talked about this situation. Um, we have record debt right now, previously, without conflict. Now, war and, and rumors of war <laughs> uh, that we hope aren't going to happen may, may even uh, increase that debt. And, uh, and, and I'm afraid that our spending habits are putting you and all policy decision makers in an even tighter box. W look, we all know that inflation is real. It's hitting, whether it's gas, 379 versus 274 a year ago, um, groceries, you name it, housing. And when you were here in July, I talked about the housing situation. My family's in construction. And, and what that means. And we can't just magically wave a wand and say, oh, we're gonna lower prices. Uh, that, that just simply isn't uh, realistic. Um, but uh, what I heard last night is the, the, that the president is acknowledging people are living paycheck to paycheck, and he understands that. Yet the message I keep hearing from the president and my friends on the other side of the aisle is we need to spend even more. And, and I'm concerned that is going to put us again into an even tighter box than we currently are. If you care to touch on that before I move on. I, I should stay away from uh, from fiscal policy if you don't. Well, it, 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 look, I'm not asking whether you support a particular bill or not. Theoretically, we're your classroom. America's your classroom as they're watching uh, as they're watching this right now. Uh, spending can is a contributing factor to inflation, correct? It is, but it's not, it's not really our job and not ours to comment on. We do have I understand a role here, that. And, and we need to do it. Well, I understand that. I just, just the facts. That's, uh, 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 all right. So I'm going to move on uh, to uh, another issue, which is uh, rules-based approach to monetary policy. 20, uh, or I'm sorry, in, uh, in the 114th Congress, I think it was in 2015, I introduced the FORM Act, um, which, uh, which would uh, lay out a rules-based um, monetary policy. And, and I know in your testimony today you indicated that a rate increase is expected, and you confirmed that with the uh, ranking member. Um, so what I'm curious, though, is in, since 2017, the Fed's monetary policy report, report included a section on monetary policy rules. And you've been very clear, and uh, uh, now Secretary Yellen has been clear that a lot of rules are, mod uh, are modeled and looked at. 
Uh, the only exception to this was 2020, the first year of the pandemic, and maybe more surprisingly, the report that was just released this month. For example, in 2017, monetary policy rule section of the report stated, quote, monetary policymakers consider a wide range of information on current economic conditions. Can, it's not included in this report. Can you shed some light on why it was admitted this year? I, you know, I honestly didn't know if that was the case or if, if someone talked to me about this before the thing was printed and sent up here, I don't remember it. That's also a, a real possibility given the number of things I, I have on my mind right now. But, um, you know, as you say, we didn't, we didn't have it in, uh, in July of 20. Um, we'll have it in the next one. I don't think it's, it's, it was any, there was no big thought as far as I know going, going into that. It's just sometimes we include it, sometimes we don't. I, I, I will say that um, I think thinking about policy through rules is, is something that I've lear I learned a lot about monetary policy doing that. When you're actually implementing policy, uh, no, no, no committee has ever really used policy rules as a way of setting policy. But they, they use them to inform simply, your thinking. It, yes, and I, I guess my idea with the Form Act was to then inform the market, and that includes us as citizens as yeah. well. And I'd like to this committee to re-examine that. So I appreciate the indulgence, uh, Madam Chair, as we had that uh, crosstalk at the beginning, uh, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, who is also the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Pro Tem Pell. Um, you know, I'm always struck that there's a real risk of hubris for those of us in our line of work, at least up here. If we get to write laws, sometimes we conclude that that means we can write the laws of physics as well, which is dangerous. Um, and I am troubled by some of the questioning of my colleagues and, you know, some of the debates around confirmation of your colleagues around climate change. The, the IPCC report that came out last week said, Climate change effects are outpacing our ability to adapt. We're seeing communities that sort of simultaneously have droughts, floods, and fires, and money is moving in surprising ways. We've seen, personally, I've seen stories just in the last month of one coastal community where the, the roads are being washed out that haven't yet paid off the bonds that were used to pay for the road, and they don't know how to reconnect those communities. Another community on the coast where the mayor is sitting there realizing that one neighborhood he can afford to build a seawall and in another neighborhood it's cheaper to relocate people and dealing with the political fallout of that decision. We have massive political risks that are coming and we know they are coming because the laws of physics do not care how we vote. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned by your response to Mr. Posey when you said that we've, I think you said we've not even done the scenarios yet, <clears throat> excuse me, on the climate change. And I understand these are complicated, but if those scenarios haven't been done, I want to start you know, we, if we don't deal with the financial fallout, the political fallout's gonna be far worse. And so I just wanna start with a very specific question. NOAA and NASA came out with a report, I think last week or two weeks ago, saying that, that Florida is looking at 12 inches of sea level rise in the next 10 to, 12, 10 to 20 years and 18 inches by 2050. That means that there are whole communities in Florida where there's going to be complete property loss before a 30-year mortgage is repaid that was issued today. Are Fannie and Freddie changing their lending standards in response to those risks in those communities in Florida and elsewhere that are now within 30 years of being unable to repay those notes? I don't know. Um, I asked the question there because in the, the CFTC report, Managing Climate Risk in the Financial Sector came out about two years ago. They noted that the, the higher an area risk for coastal flooding, the more likely the commercial banks are to be offloading their risks onto Fannie and Freddie. And so if the sophisticated players in the system are seeing this risk and we are at a federal level are backstopping, how are we isolating our federal balance sheet from that risk exposure? I think that's a very likely outcome, actually. I think as private, um, as private lenders will move away from that and... Uh, uh, will the government um, force people to move away from the coast, or will they wind up picking, we, government, that's us, wind up picking up the tab? More, more likely the latter, it seems to me. So moving away from the offloading risk onto the taxpayer, the, back when I was in the energy industry, um, one of the tells that we had that we knew there was a downturn coming in energy markets was when the big banks started creating special opportunity fund five. You know, and we all we all knew that was code for taking your Dodd Frank compliance debt capital, moving it into an equity pool, and selling it off to the least sophisticated people in the equity space. 
Um, we all know, anybody who spent time in the banking industry has seen that game. To what degree does the Fed or the Treasury have, have the ability to monitor where the, the sophisticated folks who are seeing this coming are shifting, it off to the, shifting the risk off to the less sophisticated folks in the private sector? You know, there's a lot of thinking going on about this. I, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about that. Uh, but there, there's a lot of thinking about what will happen over longer periods of time in coastal areas and things like that. I, I, can, I can look into that for you. Well, it, and it's not just coastal, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's California fire risk. Do you rebuild that house where the fire is and who's holding the paper, you know, if it burns the second time before it's paid off? It's drought risk in communities, you know, running away the capital movements. And, and to be clear, like, we are going to create so much wealth in the transition to a clean economy that I think we can find more winners than losers if we're smart about this. But there's this huge capital flight, and, and the nervousness I get is, as I said, partly that we're shifting risk onto the public sector, and partly that if we don't have a real good understanding of what the capital structure looks like in these communities, we're not seeing it. As you know, Senator Schatz and I have, have introduced this bill to push and encourage you, know, you and your colleagues to do these climate whatever we're talking about, scenario analyses, but we know the sophisticated people are going to offload the risk. And as the IPCC report said, the effects are outpacing our ability to adapt, and we need to get ahead of this much quicker. Um, I, would, I would want you to know we are, we are working on the scenarios. It's just, you know, it's, a, it's an active effort on our part. Well, let, let us know how we can help you. Make sure you have the resources to move a lot quicker. Um, thank you, and I yield back. Thanks. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again, and thank you for your testimony today. I, I appreciate your testimony that uh, overspending has contributed to the inflation crisis we're facing right now, but I also appreciate uh, your, um, your humility uh, with respect to the Fed failing to meet its price stability mandate and the fact that you admit that inflation is primarily a monetary policy phenomenon. So I want to focus on monetary policy in my questioning. And I know you understand that this has human cost. Uh, I want to share a couple of anecdotes from my district. A painter, Gerald Holland, from Nicholasville, Kentucky, says a gallon of paint costs $10 more today than a year ago. The Suffoletta family from Georgetown, Kentucky, they've been in the retail home furnishing business since the late 1940s. In a conversation last week, they informed me that in the last year, the cost of goods from their manufacturers have increased 30 to 40 percent, and they're still receiving price increase letters every week. And like most small businesses, their cost of labor, labor and overhead have gone up over 25 percent. So now they are having to determine how to operate without passing those costs on to the end consumer and still have some profits left at the end of the year. I could, I could share dozens, as many of my colleagues could share dozens of these kinds of stories, including from constituents on fixed incomes who cannot afford the dramatic reduction in their purchasing power. Um, before November 2021, uh, Chairman Powell, when you declared it was time to retire the word transitory in relation to inflation, uh, my colleagues and I repeatedly in, in these hearings last year, after the $2 trillion spending bill, we cautioned you that inflation wasn't transitory, that we were hearing from our constituents, individuals and small businesses, that inflation was hitting them hard and was sticky. But the FOMC kept up with the unconventional monetary policy. And uh, even after you retired the word transitory, as late as February 2022, the Fed was continuing its QE liquidity injections, even though inflation was at a 7.5% 40-year high. And the Fed had rejected an immediately halt to QE at both its December and January policy meetings. Um, uh, this week, economist Mohammed al Aryan published an op-ed in which he states that the Fed's insistence that inflation was transitory is, quote, an error that will likely be remembered as one of its biggest ever. And I'm, I, pardon me for contributing to your humility on that. But my question is, has the FOMC learned from its mistake? Has it learned that unconventional monetary policy at a time when it's not needed is harmful for the economy? Has it learned that QE during a time of recovery is a recipe for inflation? And has it learned that we cannot print our way to prosperity? Well, I, I think the main thing we've learned is that the supply side constraints that we saw were not as transitory as we had hoped and thought. And as I mentioned, every other 
mainstream economists and central banks around the world made the same mistake. That doesn't excuse it, but we thought that these things would be resolved long ago. D does the FOMC, do you and your colleagues concede now, in hindsight, that the ac overly accommodated monetary stance uh, for too long was a mistake, a monetary policy mistake? So I'll, I'll just answer for myself. Um, you know, I, I, that's for other people to, that, to assess. I, I would say that we had an expectation, and as I said earlier, I, you know, I, I thought that I thought there was always thought there was a chance we'd be wrong, and that if we were wrong, we'd be able to pivot. And we did pivot, and we pivoted pretty quickly. But by then, the economy really was moving very, very fast. Well, on the pivot, how quickly do you expect a higher Fed funds rate removing the accommodation to bring down inflation, and how does that affect the pace at which you will tighten? So I expect, as I mentioned, I expect uh, the Fed funds rate to go up in two weeks. And I expect a series of rate increases this year. But as I mentioned earlier, given the current situation, we're going to move, you know, uh, carefully. Um, but my, my concern is that to break this inflation fever now, you don't have a lot of good options. It, it, it's going to take some aggressive tightening in order to break a historically high inflation level. So, but not to belabor the point, just real quick final time on the, on the climate uh, stress testing. Uh, last year, in response to my questions about the Fed's decisions to join the Network for Greening the Financial System, you affirmed that the Fed's job was not to combat climate change. But in your confirmation hearing, you said that, quote, we are looking at climate stress tests. Uh, this will be a key tool going forward. To, to, to clarify, what is it? Is it? Is it that you will not use this, as Mr. Posey asked you, uh, uh, as uh, uh, to support capital surcharges for banks serving fossil energy companies? That's, that's not the design or intent of the, of the stress scenarios that we're working on right now. It is really to, to assist us and, and financial institutions who are doing these things themselves very actively, the larger ones, uh, to, to understand the risks. Well, th th my time has expired, but as we look at a ener global energy crisis with the Ukraine the invasion, gentleman's it is time critically has important we don't redirect capital. The gentleman from, from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, who is I also the chair of the task force, on financial technology is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for your, your service and, and your great work. Uh, I do want to ask you a, a question about the SWIFT uh, network. And I realize that the sanctions piece of this is owned by Treasury, but I'm curious if in any of your uh, risk analyses, uh, you've looked at the possibility that that if we did uh, completely ban Russian banks uh, from uh, use of the SWIFT network and it became a target of the of the Russian uh, uh, cyber forces have we have we basically gamed that out how that might happen and do we feel comfortable that that structurally, and architecturally, that that SWIFT network would be able to resist a you know a state-sponsored assault on on that messaging service. I'm sorry, Mr. Lynch. I'm I'm really uh, not the right person to uh, to answer that question. That's really a question that our um, Treasury Department or or in our administration more broadly and the intelligence uh, groups would be able to uh, address. I'm a little surprised at that because earlier in your question you talked about uh, cybersecurity and and how that was uh, that was in your lane in part, but uh, but but I'll let that go. Uh, you did mention the uh, recent Fed report uh, on CBDC, and in that report, it more or less pushed pushed responsibility back to Congress uh, to resolve some of the major issues around the creation of a, uh, you know, a, a, a Fed CBDC. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, I know that we have a working group uh, at MIT and the Boston Fed that are doing great work on this. It started under uh, Chairman Gensler, but now I believe Niha Narula is, uh, is, is running that, that effort. Um, in, in all honesty, uh, I'm not sure that Congress is equipped uh, by itself to make those key decisions around architecture and and the shape 
uh, and, and form of, of any uh, CBDC for the United States. And, uh, you know, I, I think we are relying on yourselves at the Fed and, and Treasury to help us. And so I was hoping for a little bit more instruction uh, with the with the Fed paper. And if, is there is there any way we could we could collaborate uh, rather than pushing the responsibility on Congress with all the other issues we've got to 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 deal with, and also with the disparity in uh, in background in dealing with uh, with with CBDC and those crypto issues. So let me yeah let me address that. So what the what the great people in Boston are doing is really technical exper technical experimentation around how you would build. Uh, a CBDC if you were going to do one, looking at different structures and options and technologies. And that, so that's separate from the policy questions of whether we should do this. So what we're, what we're thinking of, of, how we're thinking of this is there's technical experimentation, there's all the technology questions that have to be solved, but there are also the policy questions of should we do this and why and how and what should be the structure and that kind of thing. So, that's, so we'll be working on this project in coming years and we hope building trust in Congress and in the public that we're doing it as a, you know, a fair, honest, independent group who really is just looking out for the best interests of the country and of our citizens. And, and uh, we'll, we, you know, we'll be making recommendations on the appropriate structure if, if we do come to rec make a recommendation. The, the point is, though, that we, um, you know, our, our existing statute doesn't really contemplate uh, a central bank digital currency. So we would need, ideally, we would get legislation that would um, be authorizing legislation and we would, we would take part in it. It's not that we'd be asking Congress to start this from scratch and figure out all the answers. We would be working with you to build trust in our process and ultimately uh, come to you with, with a proposal and then Congress would, would work its, uh, work, do its work and, and, and authorize. Thank you, but, but uh, Mr. Chairman, the concern is that the architecture and the security of the system will guide policy. So I believe we need to work together. Uh, but thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back. No, I would agree. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here. It's always good to have you come before the committee. Uh, there hasn't been a Federal Reserve Chairman since Paul Volcker in the 80s that has uh, dealt with inflation at these levels that we talk about today. And historically, the Fed has been unable to reduce prices without sending our economy into a recession. And to further complicate the situation, the central bank has previously never had to deal with uh, winding down such aggressive asset purchases to go along with increasing interest rates. You are going to uh, have to take action on both of these uh, pressing issues with the, back, uh, with the backdrop of what we see in uh, Ukraine between the Russians and the Ukraine and uh, the gl general global uh, instability that we have. So needless to say, you have a very tough job ahead of you. Uh, so, Chairman, uh, how do you plan on getting inflation under control without completely hampering growth or worse, causing the economy to go into a recession? So that, that is exactly our objective. Um, we're going to use our tools, we're going to raise our interest rates, and we're going to shrink our balance sheet over the course of this year. As I mentioned, um, during this critical phase of, uh, of global events, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do that uh, with care, <clears throat> and we'll always move with care, but particularly now. And um, that's how it works. We remove accommodation uh, and, you know, the, the very high levels of demand that, we're, that are, to some extent, a result of our accommodative policy, those will those rates will go up and take housing, for example. Um, you know, the housing market should cool off. It's very, very hot right now. And that should happen broadly in the economy over time. Um, we, we talk about getting to neutral, uh, which is a, a, a neutral rate, which would be somewhere between two and two and a half percent. It may well be that we need to go higher than that. We just don't know. Um, and we don't know what events will intervene in the meantime. But, you know, we, we um, we haven't faced this challenge in a long time, but we all know the history and we all know uh, w what we need to do. I, I also do think, and I, I think it's uh, more likely than not, that we can achieve what we call a soft landing. And, and they're, they're far more common in our history than is, uh, than is generally understood. And that would be what you described, which is get inflation back under control uh, without a recession. 
Well, what, some of us in this room remember the 80s. What Sorry? It was, yeah. Some of us in this room remember the 80s and what it was like. Uh, we, we know that there is a lag period between the Federal Reserve's auctions, uh, uh, actions rather, and the inflammatory implications being felt uh, in the economy. Uh, the San Francisco Fed, which we've mentioned today, uh, admits that this uh, latency period uh, could last anywhere from three months to three years. And for families and business owners like myself, uh, it would uh, three years would be a, a, an extremely long time to deal with prices at uh, in these elevated levels. So, Mr. Chairman, when the Fed eventually decides to raise interest rates, uh, what tools will you uh, have at your disposal to ensure your actions are felt with as little uh, a delay as possible so we can uh, get, uh, once again, have uh, uh, price stability like we've talked about? In, in this world that we live in now, um, when we make a decision about interest rates or, frankly, even talk about a decision to raise interest rates, markets pick it up like that. Financial conditions have already tightened. Um, we haven't actually lifted off from zero, but as of a week ago, the market was pricing in, literally already reflected in, in financial conditions to some extent, six or seven rate increases. Now, it's less than that now, and we haven't made decisions to, to do that yet, but um, so um, our, our decisions get into financial conditions very quickly. It does take time, of course, for that to affect economic activity, and that's where you get three months to longer than that. I think by the end of a year, much of the effect is, is generally thought to be in. So, um, but that, that time period has already started because uh, monetary policy really works through expectations, and, and we're, we're now expecting rate increases, and they're, they're already, they've already happened, in effect, and we have to ratify them, of course. Yeah, we're seeing them. Uh, finally, in the past year, uh, uh, you have uh, referenced productivity uh, gains as, uh, as being key to increase the living standards for American workers uh, over time. Unfortunately, we've seen the Biden administration implement many new uh, time-consuming regulations that are forcing businesses, again, like mine and others, away from productive activities. The American Action Forum uh, conducted a study that estimated that uh, new regulations from the Biden's first year in office will, will culminate in over 131 million uh, new paperwork hours. So quickly, Mr. Chairman, can you discuss the correlation between a company's regulatory burden and the, F and the effect on productivity? So it, it, it's been, I, I'm a little bit familiar with, uh, with the research, and it's actually been, <clears throat> it's been difficult to, uh, to make those connections in, in research, but we know as a practical matter, um, uh, you know, we all want just the right amount of, re of regulation, not too much. And to the extent you're spending resources uh, unnecessarily, that will that'll hold you back. Thank you very much. And uh, I yield my time back, Madam Chair. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torders, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, during his State of the Union, President Biden reported that the U.S. has seen the fastest job growth in history. The U.S. has had the fastest economic growth in more than four decades. And the U.S. among advanced economies has had the fastest economic recovery from COVID. And so the inflation that we've seen is the consequence of a strong economy colliding with the supply chain disrupted by COVID-19. Given the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the inflationary pressures that could likely follow, is there a risk that raising interest rates could backfire, that it could cause a recession without actually reigning in inflation? How significant is the risk of stagflation? Well, there are several questions in there. Um, so our goal, of course, is to is to raise interest rates in, uh, in a way that, that uh, restrains inflation and gets it back to levels that we would call consistent with price stability, and do that without um, while while still having while still s sustaining uh, an expansion and a strong labor market. That's our goal, and that's that's how we'll use our our uh, tools. There are no guarantees in life, but that that is our intention and and what we propose to uh, do. Um, it's, the U.S., as you know, has severely sanctioned Russia, and Russia is expected to engage in cyber retaliation. There are financial institutions, commercial banks, that invest up to a billion dollars every year in cybersecurity. How much does the Fed invest in its own cybersecurity every year? I don't have a dollar amount for you, but uh, it's uh, quite substantial. We have very good cyber people and uh, at, at the reserve banks and, and at the board here in Washington. And as I mentioned a little earlier, um, we've been at a very highly elevated level of, uh, of uh, oversight on cyber issues. 
uh, since uh, for several months now as this as this event has increased and we we haven't seen any any um, troubling incidents yet but but we remain on uh, on high alert uh, the ability of the u.s to hold rogue states like russia accountable uh, depends heavily on the swift international payment system uh, in your view how easily could china and russia create an alternate messaging service that could seriously compete with swift and seriously undermine the effectiveness of swift sanctions I mean, and I, I, that's a that's a an interesting question to speculate about. I I think in the near term, it's it, that's not something you can create overnight. I know that China does have their their system. Um, it's really a question for the for the longer term, and uh, not for the the immediate. Uh, uh, it, it's not something you could do quickly, like that. But um, let me think about that. Fair enough. I have a question about stablecoin. Uh, the leading stablecoin issuers have chosen to peg their stablecoins to the U.S. dollar, which to me represents a vote of confidence that reinforces rather than challenges the status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. The U.S. has no CBDC of its own and is unlikely to have one in the years to come. Do you believe, as I do, that dollar stablecoins can play a role in outcompeting China when it comes to digital currencies? I'll say it this way. I think there may well be a role for well-regulated um, stable coins. I think there's, there's the possibility over time, and this is not what we see right now, that they could be efficient and popular among consumers and things like that. Uh, I, I think um, in terms of helping us compete with China, I, I, don't, I don't know, but possibly, yeah. I think... Um, I'm assuming it's better to have stable coins pegged to the dollar than to have stable coins pegged to... China's currency or the currency yes, of a separate I, country. I would agree with you that, yeah. you know, within, in a way that is consistent with yeah. the role of the dollar. And, uh, you know, most of the big stable coins are, of course, dollar based. I have a question about the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, even though the CRA exists to prevent racial discrimination in matters of lending, often referred to as redlining, regulators fail to consider race when enforcing the CRA. Do you think race should be considered? So. We went out with uh, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking a couple of years ago. We took in uh, a whole lot of comments and um, took those into account. And I think we're now sitting down with the OCC and the FDIC to come up with a notice of proposed rulemaking. And that's one of the issues that we are uh, have been thinking very carefully about. And I don't have any announcement for you, but that that's something that's uh, that's going to come out of those 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 conversations. But you're open to considering it. It's something we've been considering. We asked for comment on it. Okay. Um, that's the extent of my questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the hearing. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for coming back for your uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony, and we all wish you the best uh, of luck as you complete the, the confirmation process in the Senate. Uh, I enjoyed hearing Mr. Kustoff from Tennessee talk about uh, William McChes McChesney Martin, uh, and then it w or actually he was talking about the 70s, and I guess uh, my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, brought up William McChesney Martin. And it made me think about uh, the 1970s, and you and I both started our business careers in that decade, where inflation was really considered the number one economic concern in the United States and around the world. And Arthur Burns was your predecessor then, and I read recently a, a talk he gave called The Anguish of Central Banking. Have you ever, have you heard of that before? Yeah, it rings a bell. <clears throat> well, I, I uh, commend it to you. It was delivered in 1979, so he was no longer the chairman, and he was reflecting on his tenure in, uh, at the Fed and also on fiscal policy of the 60s and 70s. So I commend it to you and the Federal Open Market Committee and to my colleagues here on the committee. And with your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to insert it in the record. Without objection, such is the order. It's a stark reminder that when we abandon fiscal discipline and our core financial principles instead of embracing and instead embrace what I consider economically illiterate concepts like modern monetary theory, we get into economic anguish. And in this talk, Chairman Barnes uh, reflects on his own mistakes at the helm of the Fed, as well as the abandonment of conservative government finance. When Burns warns, 
fear of immediate unemployment rather than fear of current or eventual inflation comes to dominate economic policy making and that was his his warning to us and i think it's uh, it merits at this time you said you don't want to go back to the 70s in fact you argued that's what we're trying to absolutely avoid so i do uh, encourage uh, people to read this report because inflation is a thief you answered a question to mr hazanga from michigan that you were not aware that in the 2022 monetary policy report that the rules section in the monetary policy was not included is that right i'm a, i was aware of it a couple of days ago okay. I, what i said was i don't remember any prior discussion Right. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means I didn't remember it. Right. Well, do the, in the FOMC meetings, do they still have a presentation, part of the staff presentation, sort of a trend analysis on using those rules that have been traditionally in the policy report? Does that still go on in FOMC meetings? Yes, yes it does. Yeah. So I think that's an indication that's probably best that it be included in, in the report. Um, I was looking at some forecasting about the so-called Taylor Rule dating to the 1990s, which you've testified on many times. Uh, are you aware of what the Taylor Rule would indicate now in its formula vis-a-vis -vis the inflation that we have today? Generally, yeah. Uh, do you know the range that you High. Yeah. It, it, uh, the answer I saw was 9.55%, uh, which doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but it's one of those indicators about how far off we are maybe in our funds rate uh, targeting. So I'm glad to hear that you'll, you'll consider that uh, being put back in the, in the report. I also wanted to raise uh, the subject of the Fed mandate. You've taken some questions on that today too. We've had uh, legislation in the past uh, to reconsider the 1977 uh, con approach Congress took in the middle of that inflation to have both price stability and full employment. And uh, we've, we've, con we've debated that in this committee uh, before. And in my view, uh, considering to the fiscal policy stimulus and the uh, monetary policy that we've had in the last couple of years, we really have to focus on price stability. And in Congress, we're here to really prevent that kind of inflation. And I recognize and I'm happy to say it's both a fiscal responsibility and a monetary policy. Um, and so I'm, I'm proposing that we go back to price stability. And we won't be alone. As I understand it, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom have that as its, their sole mandate, price stability. Is that your understanding, too, of those central banks? Uh, yes. I, I think the ECB, uh, European Central Bank, so that will be a matter for Congress, obviously. Right. Um, I would say if I were to show you monetary policy response to five central banks and or six central banks, I'd say, three of them would be uh, like us, a dual mandate, and three of them would be uh, just inflation. You wouldn't actually see any difference in their reaction function because they, they do have to look at resource utilization, which is employment, uh, in, in order to determine policy. So we basically, you, you wind up with very similar answers. Well, I thank you for your testimony, and again, wish you well in your final confirmation process. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank, thank you. you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina Ms. Adams is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it, and uh, Chair Powell, it's good to see you again, sir. Uh, I would have you. preferred to congratulate. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, good to see you. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Of course, I would have preferred to be congratulating you on your reappointment to the Federal Reserve, but... Um, um, hopefully, uh, we can get that done. Uh, I did publish an op-ed this morning with uh, Chairwoman Waters and Congressional Black Caucus Chairwoman Beatty and some of my African-American colleagues on the Financial Services Committee uh, calling on Senator Toomey to return to the table and give you and the president the other four nominees uh, the vote that you deserve. So let me ask you a, a simple yes or no we'll do here. Do you believe that the Federal Reserve would be better able to serve the American people if it had a fully staffed Board of Governors? I, I want to thank you for your kind words and support, but I, um, I, I wouldn't want to comment directly or indirectly on the, uh, on the Senate. I'm a, you know, I'm a nominee, and, and I await the, uh, the Senate's judgment, and I'd, I'd prefer not to, uh, to get into the, uh, you know, that process other than as a nominee. 
Okay, well, thank you, sir. Let me switch gears and talk uh, for a moment about Russia. As we've discussed extensively today, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has consequences far beyond the geopolitical. We've discussed uh, the potential uh, potential systemic uh, risks the, in the invasion poses to global markets and the mechanisms to keep Russia isolated from the international economy for the duration of its illegal aggression. But I'm concerned about the potential systemic risk here at home. Uh, the European Central Bank has identified systemically uh, uh, important financial institutions with ties to Russian banks, and those institutions could potentially require assistance to live up to their obligations. So are there any U.S. institutions that you're monitoring that have outsized uh, default risk as it pertains to the, the freezes on Russia's, Russia's asset? So basically, no. Uh, our, our financial system and our financial institutions have relatively little exposure to Russia, and the, the, even the largest exposures that any of them has um, are, are not very big. So it would need to be it would need to be exposures. It would need to be a second order thing, whereby another a, a foreign a foreign uh, financial institution has exposures to Russia, but also has exposures to our banks. And we don't we don't see that as um, as a primary risk, but it's something we're watching. Okay. So with my remaining time, let me ask you. Uh, your November report indicated that the forthcoming rise in interest rates will have ripple effects throughout the entire economy. Uh, can you speak to the interconnection between the Fed's rate hikes and the freeze on Russian assets as it pertains to the prices of certain commodities? Well, I think com commodities are the price of commodities is generally set on the world market by supply and demand. Um, so. Uh, uh, we and we do uh, intend to uh, raise interest rates this year, as we've said. But as long as we're in this very uh, uh, sensitive phase of, of events in Eastern Europe, we're going to be um, um, careful in, in, in doing so. We're going to move, uh, to, you know, avoid adding uncertainty, as I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, so, um, and we, we, we do believe that over time, as we raise interest rates and as we get relief uh, from supply side improvements as well for inflation, that, that we'll get inflation back down. We expect to see that uh, happening. And to the extent we don't see it happen, then we're prepared to move more aggressively. Great. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Chairman Pro Tem. Al for uh, for being so forthright. I think your your answers to uh, Mr. McHenry's questions at the outset were incredibly helpful. I think it was probably the most direct um, that that you've been with respect to how you're viewing interest rate policy heading into the March meeting, uh, and and I certainly appreciate that, um, and I, I suspect others do as well. So so thank you for that transparency. Um, I want to start on Ukraine, uh, and I know this is uh, Ukraine and Russia, and I know this is just evolving. Um, my view, d despite some of the, what I thought was a little bit flowery rhetoric last night from the president, is uh, this is the beginning of a long-term conflict. This is not something that will be over in a matter of days, but, but months and perhaps years uh, as, as the Russians encircle uh, Ukraine and our lack of, of response in many respects. Um, I know you're a student of history and you're a student of monetary policy history. Um, when you look at the, a world where this is a longer-term conflict, uh, how do you view a longer-term military engagement in Europe impacting uh, rate policy and balance sheet policy? Uh, and if you haven't begun that study yet, is that something that the Fed will endeavor uh, in the coming weeks and months? It's, um, it's a really good question, and I, I would have to agree to you with you that this event does seem to be one that, that is uh, a game changer and will be with us for a very long time. Um, we, as I mentioned, uh, we don't understand yet, uh, there are events yet to come that we haven't seen and we don't know what the real effect on the U.S. economy will be. We don't know whether this, those effects will be quite lasting or not, um, but it's something we're going to be thinking about a lot. Uh, 
you know, it, it's exactly the, the, the things we'll be thinking about. Uh, too really too early to say, but it's not too early to try to try to imagine and, and uh, assess. Thank you, and, and I know my, my thoughts and, and prayers are, are with the Ukrainian people, as are uh, many of my colleagues, all of my colleagues. I think we were unanimous in that. Uh, we hope for a successful outcome, uh, though admittedly, uh, the, the days ahead uh, appear to be quite choppy, uh, and, and it's hard to see a positive outcome in the near term. Uh, I want to shift to another thing the President said last night around um, companies need to lower their costs, not their wages, and that's how we're going to fight inflation. Um, that sounds wonderful. How do you magically sort of lower your costs as a company? Um, is, is that some, it, it sort of implied that it's corporate greed that's, that's leading to inflation. Um, I've read your comments. I think they're spot on with respect to the supply demand dynamics. Um, but uh, is there a way for companies to just sort of unilaterally lower their costs that you're aware of? First time, I, I would I never, didn't see never the comment on the, on, the, on the president's comments uh, in any, at any time. Um, and I won't, I won't do that now. I, you know, I think my experience in the business world very much was that, that businesses are, are constantly managing their costs. That's a lot of what, what businesses do, they tend, and uh, uh, so it's, it's an ongoing thing. I, but I, I, didn't, I didn't watch the speech, and I, I, haven't, I don't know the context, and I would never comment on, on uh, anything the president says, so. Thank you. Um, shifting to my last question, uh, there's been talk of whether cryptocurrencies represent a, a good vehicle for sanctions avoidance. Um, I think you've rightly said that's, that's maybe for the, for, for the purview of Treasury. Um, but generally speaking, uh, a system that transactions occur on a public ledger uh, that are auditable and reviewable by the entire world, anybody in the world can go and, and check and monitor these things. Um, and, the, and in a world where those same systems uh, have transaction speed limits, essentially. Um, do you think in that world a public ledger is a good or sort of less good way to launder money or avoid sanctions? I, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not an expert on sanctions and, and it's a very, so I'm reluctant to comment on that in the context of sanctions just because it's not our, it's not our field and, I, and uh, I mean, I, I would say a public transaction, you know, you, you, there's, a comp, there's a balance you have to strike between privacy, which is very important, yeah. but also the ability of law enforcement uh, to, uh, you know, and, and national security to track payments. And I think it, to the extent that, that um, you know, cryptocurrencies are a means by which you can evade both law enforcement and national security concerns, then, then that's not something we should tolerate. Thank you. Thank you for, again, your, uh, your transparency, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from uh, Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, and thank you, Chair Powell, for being before us again today with such forthright testimony in such challenging times. I wanted to just start uh, on the question of inflation and uh, something that you said to one of our colleagues in response uh, to a question. You said uh, that uh, inflation is too high. We're seeing it everywhere in the world. Ours is worse because our economy is stronger. Can you flesh out that duality a little bit, maybe by way of contrast with uh, others globally who are struggling with inflation uh, but do not have a strong underlying economy? Sorry, I think if you look at our, uh, the, maybe the closest um, economies and political systems would be the countries of Western Europe and Canada, um, you know, advanced economy countries like that. They're all having the highest inflation they've had in a very long time. Places like Germany, which is famously, famously, uh, you know, inflation averse, has high inflation. Now, ours is a little higher. Uh, our economy is now well above uh, the level of output that, that, uh, that we were at before the pandemic. If you just look at the, the, out, the, amount, the output an economy had before the pandemic to where it is now, we're way above that, and other countries are kind of just getting back to that level. So um, we've just had a stronger recovery, and that is because of monetary policy and fiscal policy and also just vaccines and all, a whole range of factors 
So our inflation is definitely, of, of the advanced economies, ours is, is higher, generally. Um, so, and I, you know, we're going through the same process that the, that the Bank of England and other central banks are going through, which is, um, you know, raising rates and trying to get inflation back under control. Very committed to doing that. Um, it's, a, it's a common problem. Uh, again, ours is worse because, because our inflation is higher, because our, I think largely because our, our economy is, is that much stronger. And I know you have a series of, of meetings and, and uh, possible rate hikes. Uh, you talked about in two weeks, likely the 25 basis points increase. For my constituents, uh, my consumers, uh, what impact will we begin to see, will they begin to see with uh, the small incremental rate hikes? So it's a little bit like um, the, the, the rate hikes that took place um, in the first part of this century, not, not the rate hikes that took place after the global financial crisis were much slower. They were every other meeting. Uh, but the one, the cycle before that, uh, the rate hikes at consecutive meetings. So what you feel is these are fairly small rate increases, a quarter of a percentage point every, every seven weeks. And we haven't, by the way, we haven't made any decisions after this meeting. But the thought is that, that you, you, rates move up, uh, the, our policy rate moves up, and with it, uh, you know, rates on mortgages, rates on, oh, rates on car loans, rates on, uh, you know, uh, the loans that people take out to buy appliances and things like that. So companies, their borrowing costs go up. And, you know, uh, you get to a point where you've raised a, a few times and, and, and the, you know, the, it's, it's, uh, it's even still a gradual process, even though it's fast, you know, as much as twice as fast as the last cycle. But still, you, you, start, you start to, people start to spend a little bit less and the economy demand goes, you know, returns to a lower level. Um, by this time, we hope that, um, you know, that the economy is going back to normal in terms of supply chains and, and the breakdown between goods and services spending and things like that. So we hope we're getting help from, on the inflation front from a bunch of things. In any case, we do have the responsibility to generate price stability and we will use our tools to do that uh, over time. I uh, thank you for that. One particular area of concern for me is the role that increasing market consolidation has played in contributing to inflation. An example uh, that we've seen is the huge price spikes in the meat industry, which has become incredibly uh, consol concentrated, consolidated. To what extent uh, would you attribute supply chain fragility and recent price increases to market concentration? So we, we're, we're not the competition authorities, and so I would defer to the competition authorities on, on all those questions. Uh, in, t in terms of inflation, though, inflation really is it, mainly a macroeconomic phenomenon, and, 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 which doesn't link in the aggregate very well to concentration. Some of the most concentrated, concentrated industries, in fact, were those that drove low inflation. Uh, I'm thinking there of warehousing and retail and things like that. Those industries consolidated and they drove lower prices. So it's not, it's not so obvious. There are clearly are industries where that, that, that may be the case where they become consolidated and, and they're able to raise prices. It's not clear they'd be able to generate a, an inflationary cycle, but they can certainly, could certainly raise prices uh, in, in the first instance. It's, it's, not a, it's not a settled question in the economics, but uh, the again, we defer to the competition time. authorities. Gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Inflation remains a serious concern for my constituents in West Virginia. Inflation erodes the real value of every paycheck. When the cost of filling a tank of gas or buying groceries increases, all Americans lose money. Today, I'd like to focus on a slightly different aspect of inflation which is inflation's corrosive effect on Americans' savings. The combination of low interest rates and high inflation has clobbered returns on common savings tools, like savings accounts, money market funds, and certificates of deposit. January's 12-month consumer price index of 7.5% pushes the yield on these savings tools into deeply negative territory. In other words, with inflation as high as it is, Americans who have saved responsibly for years are losing their money over time. So Chairman Powell, first question is, how concerned are you about the effects inflation and negative savings yields are having on the long-term health of our economic recovery? So I, I would agree that um, 
inflation falls heavily on people who are living on, for example, um, bank deposits and CDs, and this is typically retired people and the elderly, and of course they do bear the brunt of this. So that's why we need to get, one of the reasons we need to get inflation back down to appropriate levels, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. Um, savings is an important way to achieve financial goals, like purchasing a new home, paying for college or retirement. Savings is a way to take control of your financial destiny. Savings is a part of how we can achieve the American dream. So I'd like to raise another potential issue about the declining value of savings and its implications going forward. I'm concerned that our current economic environment will discourage savings altogether. So Chairman Powell, are you concerned about the effects inflation and negative savings yields could have on Americans' incentives to save money going forward? Interesting. If it were to persist for a long time, I would be concerned. Of course, right now, um, savings are, the level of savings on people's balance sheets is at historic highs because they, they saved during the pandemic. They, they weren't able to spend money on travel. So right now, we're looking at a couple trillion dollars of savings above where they would have been without the pandemic. But over, over time, yes, we, 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 savings is important, and, and I would agree that high inflation can be a disincentive. Okay, thank you. I think it's important we monitor the savings rate closely with this in mind. If Americans save less, that could have economy-wide implications both now and especially in the future. Uh, so we should be careful uh, to ensure monetary policy encourages savings going forward. And that's all I had. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Chairman Pro Tem Powell, for being with us today. And I think I'm going to be last, so I'm trying to kind of try to be soft. Uh, in a recent press conference, you had mentioned that forecasters expect inflation to subside as supply chain disruptions issues are resolved. I understand this is being addressed, and my colleagues and I are working on addressing this supply chain crisis through multiple legislative solutions. At home in Houston, one of the nation's shipping and energy capitals, we are focused on expanding and developing the nation's ports and waterways to continue building our role in facilitating global energy and trade. You also said uh, in your re remarks today that we understand the high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. So I want to focus some on housing. In Houston, housing costs have skyrocketed, with the median price rising 18% last year and the average 16%. Nationwide, housing and the rent prices account for roughly one-third of the CPI. And most economists do not expect this problem to be resolved as quickly as supply chain bottlenecks. In your earlier exchange with my colleague, Congressman Williams, you mentioned a soft lending, wherein the Fed will address inflation first and survey the, survey the housing prices trending downward. My question is this, is the Fed looking at alternative plans? In the event that housing prices do not trend with inflation, how might that impact inflation reviving if low housing supply continues to in the upward uh, pressure? So we, we do, um, as you mentioned, housing costs and um, uh, housing services costs, and how, if you're a renter, uh, they're, they're a very big chunk of, uh, of what goes into the inflation indexes. And um, to the extent housing prices, we're not saying they'll go down. What we're saying is that the increases, the increases will be much smaller. We don't, we don't need housing prices to actually decline, just as long as they, what we can't have is them, we don't want to have is have them increasing at very high levels as they have been doing. Largely as a function of supply and demand, you know, supply is constrained. I don't, I don't know about Houston, but many places in the country, um, difficult to find lots, difficult to find labor, uh, difficult to get materials, or materials very expensive. We're experiencing that. Yeah, and, and, and so, and, and demand is very strong. So and interest rates are low, um, and what you get is, is a lot of buyers and, and not enough new houses. So what, what will happen as we raise interest rates, and this is already happening, it's already priced in, is mortgage rates will go up, and you'll see that um, bidders, uh, you know, prices, prices will begin to go up more slowly, 
demand will decline and hopefully we'll, we'll get back to a place where, where um, demand and supply are well aligned. Will we ever get back to the pre-pandemic levels? To, sorry, to? Will we get back to the pre-pandemic -pre levels? Of price? Yes, sir. No, I, 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 would, I would only expect that we could limit further price increases. We're not trying to drive prices back down. What we're trying to do is limit future, uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, f future prices. Right. Increases. Now, how concerned are you that there seems to be a lack of investment in affordable housing and how that could cause inflation to become a long-term problem, even if the Fed is able to get inflation under control in other segments of the economy? So now specifically about public housing. Public housing is, of course, not our, um, it's not our, our policy tools don't generally meet the need for, for uh, affordable housing. Um, it's really a, a more of a fiscal policy and a housing policy question. Um, but I, I know that you, you, you know, economic research shows that, uh, you know, high, high housing costs for, for workers are, are making it difficult for people to live close to where they need to be going for work. And, it, and it, is, it is limiting the ability of people to be in the workforce and ultimately limit, limiting our economy. So I will say that. Last question, you, you mentioned in your remarks that it impacts essentials like food, housing, and transportation. What, what, what does this do, do to the poverty rate, increased inflation? And because I know un, unemployment is down, does that necessarily mean Poverty is coming down, or does it stay continue to rise with inflation? So those things would have offsetting effects. Um, you know, to the extent uh, inflation is going up and people or faster than people's wages, and that's actually not the case for people at the lowest end of the of the spectrum because that's where the highest wage increases have been in the aggregate. Um, you know, but to the extent that were happening, that would potentially increase poverty. But to, to the extent people are going back to work, that would decrease it. Thank you. Madam Chair, you'll back. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Mr. Powell for his testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask Mr. Powell to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned.